Good afternoon, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen. Um, may I have your attention, please, uh, for some general safety announcements before the meeting commences? Uh, please take note of the emergency exits. Uh, they're mainly at the back of the hall where you entered, and there's one behind us here as well. Um, in the event of an emergency, please leave the building by your nearest exit. If you require assistance, um, please let a member of the policing authority staff know and they're dotted around the room. Uh, as you will be aware, this event will be streamed live on the internet and a video recording will be made of the meeting for online broadcast. In this context, um, I'd be grateful if you'd please check now that your mobile phone is switched off or set to airplane mode so as not to affect the live streaming feed. And you should also be aware that anybody present may appear as part of the record. If you need to leave the room during the meeting, please do, do so quietly. Um, and as usual, today's meeting is an engagement between the authority and the Garda Commissioner, and the audience is present to observe. <coughs> Therefore, there'll be no opportunity for anybody other than the authority and the Garda representatives to participate in the meeting. Welcome to this meeting in public authority with the Garda Commissioner and welcome to those watching us um, on the web. I, um, I'm probably going to forget somebody, but I noticed looking across the front row that we have two people who are certainly, I don't believe, were with us in public before. I think, Tony, you weren't here before. So, Tony McLaughlin, you're welcome, and David McInerney, uh, you're welcome. I think Thanks the rest so much, of you man. are regular attenders, at least the people on the front row. So, uh, I'm, you'll forgive me for singling out the two, uh, the two newcomers. We're, we're, we're very pleased to have you here. We have a full agenda uh, this afternoon, uh, but just to begin, um, we had a good discussion with the Commissioner in private session just now about matters to do with serious crime, and I'd like to invite the Commissioner just to say some words in public uh, that we discussed in, in private session. Commissioner, please. Uh, Yes, Chair, I think uh, we've been pretty busy over the past few weeks and months in the context of some serious incidents that have occurred right around the country. And uh, I would just like to take this opportunity to thank again uh, the members of the public who came forward and gave us uh, great assistance and in the uh, information that they were able to provide us, which was very uh, instrumental in bringing those cases to uh, a, a state where we have been able to submit files to the Director of Public Prosecutions, etc. So again, I think uh, we, we say this all the time, but uh, I think uh, the public need to be reminded that uh, even the smallest details or maybe that may f seem to them to be of no value can be sometimes, the, when they all are added together, the, the, the little bit that will uh, get us across the line. So, Mila Buichas and Fobol Asacht in Coibdushin. Falcha, and thank you. And we also noted, I think, it's fair to say in private session, some ex excellent policing work and the unfortunate pattern that has emerged of um, where, due to uh, ex excellent policing, serious inroads has been made on the serious and organised crime side so that those homicides are down and unfortunately being balanced up um, by a series of, of um, murders that are not connected to organised crime, and that that's, um, that's just a trend that we noted, uh, um, and we'll return to it again on a future day. Um, the first item on our formal agenda today, this afternoon, is the Commissioner's monthly report to the Authority. This is a document that we do pay a lot of attention to, but sometimes in public session it's the last item, and we give it five minutes, so this time we decided before we all run out of energy we would begin uh, with the Commissioner's report, and the Authority's engagement with you on it is going to be led by Pat Costello. Thanks, Chair. And Commissioner, thank you for the report. It is indeed a, a very valuable report that has evolved over, over the last two years, so we very much appreciate it. And I think, as you say in the curving letter, there are successes and challenges. So like the Chair, I just want to acknowledge the successes you outlined in Appendix C, a lot of successes, operational successes, and to acknowledge that, I think it's really good that you communicate that and, that, and the public can see it. Uh, also on community engagement, maybe a question on community engagement. Uh, I thought that was a very interesting report as well. You talk about campus watch, inter-club boxing, summertime, safety. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, my, my feeling is many, you know, if you visit a guard the station, that goes down very well with the local community. So I just wanted to, to ask you, is it 
been well received uh, by local communities? And then how do you plan it? Is there an integrated approach to it? Or is there a lot of freedom for different divisions or regions to do their own, what they think is appropriate? Um, so I was quite interested in the community engagement report in your report. In the community engagement space, of course, yeah. Well, uh, yes, there, there is a lot of latitude for, for I suppose, a local um, nuanced work to be done in the context of, of the uh, type of community, whether it's rural, urban, or, or uh, maybe, uh, you know, in the large provincial towns. Um, but every opportunity would be, would be used, and, and I think it's important uh, when you look at the way, um, I suppose, our track record in this area is based essentially around involvement, not just of Gardaí during their official hours of work, but uh, when they go home as well and when they get involved in, in, in local clubs, etc. These are, these are all vital, uh, I think, uh, I suppose, components of a successful community engagement model. Uh, it's one that we're very proud of uh, in the organisation, and I think it's something that's very, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, important that we maintain in, 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 our, in our push for modernisation and all of that uh, good work, which is very important in the context of giving the public that we serve a modern professional policing service, that we don't lose sight of that most important and essential of our elements of our service, which is the community engagement piece. I know Paddy Lee is here and he can give you more detail in the context of... No, I just wondering that, 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 that that's all very, very positive. Yeah. And I presume you share experiences. If something works well in one area that is shared with Tartan and Garda Sheikana, maybe they can pick up ideas. So I presume that all that happens or, or does it? Yes? Yes, it yes, does. It does. Yes, right. it does. Okay. okay, can we go on then maybe to some of the uh, challenges? And the yes. first one, I suppose, that we normally start with is finances. And... Um, so, like we're 19.7 million over budget, pay is 20.1 million over budget, and overtime is 12.4 million over budget. So all these are adver uh, adverse variances. Uh, we had a look at the reports, the monthly reports this year, and the trends are, I suppose, going the wrong way. Um, it's not getting any better. Uh, so, I suppose we're interested really in, you know, how, how are you going to get back on track, and what are the year-end projections going to be? So, I suppose, can you provide any uh, examples of what corrective measures are being taken to get back on track, particularly in relation to overtime? Uh, this work um, that didn't start today or yesterday. This is something we've been focused on since uh, last October in the context of this year's budget. Um, as you're well aware, there's large components of our uh, service that are demand-driven. Uh, but what I want to see underlying all of that is prudent management of budgets. Uh, and that is what I've been um, insisting on uh, with the assistant commissioners that are in charge of our, our regional uh, our di and divisions around the country. Uh, to give you more detail in the context of, of actual uh, yeah. measures put in place, I, I can ask uh, Joe maybe to elaborate on those. Okay. Uh, thanks, Pat, for the questions. I guess the biggest issue that of discretion we spend, if that's the right phrase to use, that, that's, that's a variance is in the area of overtime. And, and I know comment on that. It's been a matter that's been discussed at our monthly senior management team meetings and will be discussed again at our meeting tomorrow. Uh, to it's, uh, and, and I guess when you look at I described our time as discretionary spending, yet a very considerable portion of that is non-discretionary in its, in its nature. So a third of the overtime spend relates to uh, an agreement reached and a pay agreement reached. The next another roughly 20% relates to attendance at um, at court. So that's bringing us very quickly into a, into a difficult space to make available overtime for the, the, what it's really needed for for the the, the um, actions and um, that we need to take around the country. Uh, notwithstanding that, the um, senior leadership team are, have a, have made a, a series of decisions around the amount of overtime that should be adopted. So. Uh, their caps have been applied for uh, the amount of overtime that individuals can work in a, in a four-week roster. Uh, and additionally, the authorisation processes have been made more robust so that assistant commissioners as well as chief superintendents will be more familiar with, uh, with overtime spend that's happening in, in districts and in stations. Um, we keep that under consideration and, as I, as I mentioned, will be looked at again at our, at our meeting tomorrow. It's just that the expectation is that there will be no supplementary budget this year. So um, how confident are you that you can get back on track? 
I, I think there's, personally, in terms of the, the pay, if we put aside the overtime piece, I, I see that being difficult, if, if not impossible. I don't believe that the, uh, the funding for the salary subhead provided for the, the expectations that were set on us in terms of recruitment targets. And the, the spend that we are seeing merely reflects the recruitment that we, have, we are committed to achieving. Uh, so I would have to be very, I would be uncertain that we would be in a position to, um, to deliver the salaries, the pure salaries component of our vote within the allocation that's made. And have you commenced engagement with the relevant departments on we've, the we've challenge been, ahead? We have, yeah. We, there, we've, been, we've had discussions. This, this issue has been raised with, the, with our parent department, Department of Justice and Equality, for some time. Yeah. Uh, and as late <coughs> as this week, there was a, a broader meeting uh, with, uh, which included the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform around the issue. So we have made them very aware of, of what's there. You know, there is an expectation and the public want to see more civilians in the organisation, want to see more Gordy in the organisation, mm. and we are seeking to progress that issue uh, but that brings a charge and brings a cost, and as I said, I, I, I do not see, I see huge challenges in, in us being able to deliver the, the salaries component within budget for, by end year. Okay. Um, do you feel you have enough uh, management information to understand the drivers of um, unbudgeted overtime? Um, I, I, don't, I don't believe we do. I think we suffer from the absence of, of sophisticated systems uh, to enable us to, uh, to track that to the level of granularity that would, we would want. There certainly have been some processes that have been put in place, um, and I know, for example, in, 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 uh, in the DMR to, to assist in that regard, but nationally, no, we don't. Our financial management systems are, like other ICT systems in the organisation, you know, reflect the large amount of underinvestment over many years. So they're not sophisticated enough, and we need to do more work in that area. And, and I think that's a, it's a matter that I've impressed upon our, our Executive Director of Finance to, to, to look at, you know, new systems and more, uh, more reasonable approaches to, to manage. I'm going to ask you to come on to technology generally sure. in a while. Yeah. Um, rosters, are, is the roster system a problem, uh, or adding to the problem, particularly where you have people who aren't out, who are desk bound, if you like, or who have desk jobs, if you like, uh, and they're on a roster, as I understand it, which attracts uh, additional allowances that perhaps, perhaps a normal working week would be more appropriate for that category of, of your, of your I, staff I, members. I, do I have the, the raw evidence to confirm that is exactly the case? I don't have that data to, to hand. This week, the new rosters and duty management system um, commenced yeah. uh, in, in the DMR East. I think that will bring out, I think it will shine a light onto that area. Yeah. So we would expect that, you know, certainly within a few months we'd have a better sense on whether there's any evidence to back up that question, Pat. So okay. today I can't say yes, but, but I know that the investment in the new roster and duty management system will help us answer those okay. exact well, questions. And it's good you got off the shelf system as well, which, yeah. uh, which, which, yeah. which, which is good news. Okay, well, listen, the finances, are, I think, are going to stay on the agenda, so we'll be sure. just revisit it at our regular meetings. If I could go on to estate management, and thank you. I think at the last public meeting, we were talking about this, and you said you'd give me something uh, on, where, on the picture generally on estate management. So you did. You gave, uh, we have a one-page report here, uh, green and blue one. And um, I suppose, you know, it does identify, you know, some of the stations that... Uh, that are, that are, I suppose, being looked at. It, it doesn't really give the time, maybe when it's going to happen. In some cases, it does. And then it does mention some are public-private partnerships and, and some are not. So it has some information. But I just wonder, do you have a, you know, a complete picture of what, how big the problem is? Um, and, you know, how much, what exactly has to be done? How much is it going to cost? How are you going to approach it? And uh, What's the time plan to do it? Because I think it is quite an issue for some of your members in stations which are you know, not exactly ideal for working. I think the report that we shared with you was, a, it was in essence the subject of discussions between ourselves and the Office of Public Works for our primary uh, aid in, in the estate management space and reflected those areas which were seen as the highest priority for, for attention. Of course, we recognise that around the country that there are other places where we would like to, uh, we would like to see greater progress, and they remain the, the subject of discussions between ourselves and the OPW. 
Uh, so if, if we look at issues around cost and around timelines, they're primarily a matter for, for the OPW to address and deal with, uh, and that's why we haven't provided, but we can certainly talk to the OPW and provide greater information if it would be assistant, of assistance to the authority. Um, in, in that regard, though, clearly there are places. I mean, I, I look at my own, my own hometown where, where the station really has, the town has outgrown the station. Um, but there are some positive, positive um, moods going on, like we're not that far away from the new Kevin Street station that's been opened, which is a beacon for the kind of uh, district office that we would like to see you know, grown and developed around the country. Within the next two weeks or so, we expect to receive the keys for the new station in Galway, and we have already opened the station in Wexford, and, and they point to the types of services that our members and the public are entitled to receive in, in the context they're engaging with us. We'd like to see more of that. Um, but clearly, it's a, it's a matter that, is the, that needs to be discussed further with our, between ourselves and OPW around what capital uh, allocation is available to us. And in many ways, the nature of our budgetary processes um, are highly dependent on what capital allocation can be provided in a, in a given year. We have to welcome the, the, the broader uh, capital envelope decisions that are made by government and we have a better sense of what information and what investment can be made over a multi -year, on a multi-annual basis. I think we can do a bit more in that space. I think it would be very useful if you had a report, a more comprehensive report than the wood page, for your own sake and also for us as the oversight body, to, that we can all understand what the problem is, how big is the problem how much they're going to cost in broad figures and what's the realistic time frame to try and do it. Um, I, I would encourage you to, to, to we'll do that. that. Certainly. Uh, I think that, that would be useful. I noticed that you have two working groups, as I understand it, yourselves, OPW, and the department working, working on this issue. Uh, that, no, that's correct. And I, in fact, this, this is not something that any one of us can address on our own. Yeah. It's got to be a partnership by all, by all you know, arms of government, and I think those yeah. working groups are critically important. It would be very interesting for us to understand as well, you know, why some projects are PPPs and some are not, and your experience as to which has given, given you the best result. Uh, I'm not an expert, I don't know which gives you the best result. The core service found PPPs to be very, very uh, successful, uh, but I'm sure that's something you're looking at, and you might include that in the report. When you're well, doing just again explain though, this is primarily an issue between the Office of Public Works and the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. And, and they relate to broader national macroeconomic issues as much as they relate to the individual project areas. In, in, in respect of the PPPs that were shown in the list that's there, they formed a natural bundle of an appropriate capital amount that would make sense from a, from a, a financial um, provision perspective. Um, Military Road or you know, the, the, the new development that will that will replace their existing operations in Harker Street and done in a different way. So they are looked, these issues are looked at on a case-by-case -case basis with the funding partners as well as the Office of Public Works and ourselves engaged on, on, those, on those areas. Okay. Well, listen, we'd welcome uh, a comprehensive report that we can understand uh, the size of the problem and what's been done about it. If I go on to uh, civil, civilianisation, um, so the report, um, I think it's, no, you're not on target, so uh, maybe the Commissioner wants to take this and I don't know. Um, What's realistic now to achieve by the end of the year in terms of civilianisation? Again, I, I, I let the people who have the numbers give you the detail, uh, Pat, but I can okay. assure you that Pat, this yeah. is absolutely uh, one of the top level priorities yeah. uh, that I have taken to the, to yeah. the office since I came in. Uh, we, we are well aware of the, um, the benefit that we can get from the uh, addition of uh, skilled resources into our organisation. Uh, while at the same time allowing those highly trained individuals uh, who are sworn members of Angarda Shikhana to return to frontline duty. Uh, and wh while it's, it's uh, been very seriously treated in the context of, of, of what we're trying to uh, do that in as quick a manner as possible, it's, it's a complex area. Uh, but, uh, and I know Just maybe that very briefly, what's the expectation in terms of numbers for the year end? I believe we, we, will, we will definitely achieve 250 redeployments. Um, that, that will be achieved. Our target is to exceed that. But I think if you're asking for a realistic number... that was 700, wasn't it? it? That's correct. Yeah. Um, but that, I'm, you're asking me what, what I believe is yeah, yes, achievable, question, and I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm giving you the answer, which I believe will be 250. But I think what, what to assure the authority... What happened? There's a sense of momentum yeah. that has developed now. Uh, yeah. The number is progressing, and I think the... 
um, the, pr the, the speed at which we will be in a position to address in this will only accelerate rather than decelerate. So there were, there were barriers at the start, and barriers sounds very negative, but ma matters that we needed to address and deal with. Are um, the barriers removed? Including, including the pace at which we recruit individuals into the organisation, the natural uh, the dialogue and discussions that, that need to take place with the representative bodies and the civil service trade unions. Um, what we are, tar what we have chosen to do is to target specifically uh, individual posts. We've made decisions that certain categories of posts will be uh, will now only be occupied by civilians, and that work will continue, and that we will dedicate a staff member and team to take on this as, as a block of work uh, to ensure that the overall number of the additional, you know, the, the 1,500 that, that's been referenced before be achieved by, by the deadline that was set out. Well, look, I suppose 250 is disappointing in terms of the objective of 700, and again, it's like the uh, finance and the stage management, we'll, we'll just have to keep it on the agenda. Um, we, we share the disappointment, Chair, I, yeah. I can say. We, you know, it's something that we want to achieve. As I said, I think there has been progress. We are seeing the numbers beginning to increase now. And, and I, you know, we've committed to 250. Let's hope that um, you might smile at me when we get to the December meeting when we can say the figure is more than 250. Okay. We, we certainly Managing will. expectations. <laughs> Maybe move on then, because uh, I know a few members want to ask questions as well as uh, after I'm finished. Technology, and thanks for the information. It's good to see some projects progressing, uh, important projects. You mentioned the roster there already. But again, just like the estate management, um, I, I know I would love to know, and I'm sure the board would love to know, and uh, how big is the problem? You know, uh, we know tech ICT is a, is a, a big shortcoming in Agarda Shikana for you to achieve your reform. Uh, but I don't have a picture of how big the problem is um, and what might it cost. And it was very difficult to put a price on these things. Um, and I'm, the strategic plan, the strategic plan for ICT is due shortly, I think. Uh, so maybe it's going to be included in that. But again, to get, and it was very useful to have the individual projects and know how they're progressing. <coughs> but again, to look at the bigger picture, and you mentioned information on rosters there, um, or on finance, sorry, on finance and managing costs. So do you, have, when, do you have that bigger picture, if you like, of what the problem is, and what's going to cost to fix it, and what the approach to fixing it is? I caution against the use of the word problem, because it does suggest that, yeah. that there's something that, yeah, exactly. Gap, Gap I think, is a, is, a better, is a better phrase. I think underinvestment in technology over many years equally is probably reflective in the scale of work that needs to progress a variety of systems around there. That said, there are basic systems that are not, basic ICT systems that do not exist in Angola Shikana. Financial Management 1, uh, you know, our Executive Director HR will point to HR as well as, as those. Uh, that said, equally, our members need to, to have more technology available to them in operational roles. And I think that, for me, is probably one of the, the biggest issues that we need to try and address and deal with. We need but to is give. it defined? That's my question. Is it defined? Do you know what, what you want to do and then what the priorities are? So the strategy is, uh, the strategy, the new ICT strategy is close to completion. We're equally engaging the assistance of a, um, and, and I want to be careful about this because the words here, the, an expert in <coughs> technology in the police field to assist us in quality assuring the work that's been done. And that will happen over the summer months um, so that we know that coming out of the new ICT strategy that there will be a, a police imprimatur, I guess, around it following what one would expect in other police forces worldwide. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen, we look forward to the report. The quicker you get it to us, the I think, and as I understand it, the, the policing authority do attend meetings of the ICT uh, governance board, and you know, we, we're very welcome, and, and there'll be further discussions on those issues yeah. after that. I believe the meeting in the next yeah. two weeks or so. Yeah. So we'll but it's your, I suppose, it's your thoughts, it's your, it's your project that we want to yeah. see uh, visibility on. Could I just add, uh, yeah. Pat, I think it's important to, you know, there's already a huge investment in technology, and those projects are well, well advanced as we speak. Uh, so I know while the strategy will, will outline future uh, and additional matters that need to be addressed, there was a very comprehensive uh, look taken at this a few years ago, and the commitment by government to a capital investment of over 200 million, that is, that is ongoing, and we expect to see the, start reaping uh, the rewards of that investment over the coming months. Uh, you know, in that, a lot of those large ICT projects are, will start to be delivered. Uh, and, of course, we have to keep an eye uh, once we raise that level, that we stay there and that we stay at the vanguard rather than being playing catch-up again. That's why it's important we need a strategy. 
Yeah, I think it's important that we understand the gap uh, yes. and wh wh where you want to get to. Just a few more things before I leave time for my colleagues. The Code of Ethics, uh, notice in the policing plan, it's, um, and some of the commentary, it's you're off target. I think the idea, plan was everybody would be get their training, face to face training, at the end of Q2, and at 8,000, 8, so you're about roughly 50%. So I suppose my question is, is, is that the case, that it's not going to happen by Q2? And if it's not, well, uh, when, when, when will it happen? I might ask uh, uh, Assistant Commissioner Leahy to comment on this. He's another he's involved in the, the training. Yeah, and, and I think we, we, we knew that once we ran into uh, difficulty with some IR issues early on, that we had to postpone some of the training uh, that we were engaged in. Uh, we've just over 8,000 done now uh, at the moment, which in the, in the context of, of what we've been through is really, really good. The turnout is, is, yeah. is, is quite effective. We're happy with the turnout. The engagement is really, really good. Uh, I, I, I know you've been at some no. of the regional yes. launches there uh, yes. recently. Yes. Uh, we had two ourselves up in Westminster over the last uh, number of weeks. So in terms of the quality of it, it's really good. It's not going to be finished by the uh, end of June. That's for, that's for sure. We yeah. know that. It, it just didn't. Um, I would be really happy if we got it done and dusted uh, by the end of the year past. That's the reality uh, of it, if we got total penetration you know, across the organisation. But what I'm most happy about is the engagement that's taking place. I know, and we've, uh, seen, and we've seen some of that, and it, it is encouraging. I suppose and it, it's improving, all that it's improved since the beginning. Like, the engagement at this point is very, very different to the engagement in the first uh, okay. few outings that we've had. Like, you know, so I'm really, really happy about that. We would have been a lot happier uh, if the training had been carried out earlier. That'll be two years from the time of the launch of the code, so it's, it's, it's quite a long time. One concern we have, and as this isn't, this, this, you know this, is um, that we require, and you require, uh, that every member will sign the form committing to <coughs> abiding by the code. And uh, I suppose we're disappointed uh, to hear that some members are, are not doing that. They have a problem signing the code. While they might be enthusiastic about the training, uh, we're probably aren't the signing it. So maybe you can give me an update on, or give us an update on, I think it was less than 40% of our signing at one stage, um, of where you see, where, 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 what percentage of people are signing now, or have signed, and what can you do to address the problem? I think it's a serious thing if, if people don't sign. No, we, we've engaged the college in terms of, uh, we're not engaging directly uh, from my office, we'll say, with, with the people that are going to delivering the training. The college are driving it out from Templemore. So they're engaging with the chief superintendents in the divisions to determine, okay, where we're at. We know exactly who has and who hasn't signed at this point in time, so we will be engaging them in a conversation as we move closer uh, to the end. There was a couple of technical issues that uh, arose. They're exploring that at the moment to see what exactly we have, because... It was, uh, it was a matter of ticking a box for some of them in putting in the returns from the CPD schools. You know, some of them didn't tick the box that had been said when we know it had been. So they're exploring that at the moment. So the 40% that we uh, gave at our last meeting yeah. actually is probably lower than it, than it was in terms of the people that are signing. You know, it'll go up. At the end of it, I've no doubt we're going to end up with a cohort of people who have not signed. You know, and we will have engaged with them. There's a very different conversation we're going to have to have with them at that stage. I have engaged with the associations on this matter uh, on, on, on more than one occasion now, and I've been very, very clear about where we are in relation uh, to this, and I expect that we'll be engaging with them again uh, at, the, at the end of the summer. But we have, a, uh, we have a way to go with it at the moment. I think it'll be a pretty serious situation if we have a large number of members who haven't, who haven't signed at yeah. the end of the day. I think that'll be... I think it'll be a huge own goal. That would be, would, would Sorry, be very, very, yeah. very, very bad, yeah. If I could just maybe add and yeah, take the opportunity again uh, to ask all of our members who are in receipt of that training, I know that all our, our young people coming through the college uh, signed their, uh, for the Code of Ethics uh, that, they, that they read and understood it, uh, and all our senior management team have done so. Uh, I'd encourage all members to do so uh, at the end of the training period and, and give that commitment. And I'm open to hearing what their concerns are uh, in the context of, of what, yeah. what, what uh, issues they have about that. And that's part of my, my commitment to them, but I think it's important that we all uh, come yeah. on board. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think it would be good if you did get to the bottom of it, what the problem is. Yeah. Okay. A few more things, if I have time. Have I? One, okay, one last I thing. So, Nick, so you're on your um, last one. There are a lot of reds in the policing plan, so we don't have time to go through that now unless some of our colleagues pick it up. Pick up but they're all good. There are quite a lot of reds. An off track in the policing plan, which uh, I know the colour scheme is great, you can see exactly uh, what's green and what's red, and there are quite a lot of reds there, that would be a concern. Maybe just one last thing, then, very quickly. 
the recruitment campaign um, you gave us a report on that in the Commissioner's report. So um, do you think it's appealing to a broad range of candidates? Is it is one of your objectives that you would have a broad range? Maybe we'll come back to that on it's the diversity. It's in the diversity. Yeah. Yeah. In the interest of moving That's it along. Yeah. Would that yeah. be okay, yeah. Pat? That's good, yeah. okay. We'll come back to that on the diversity piece in a minute. Just before I pass over to Noel, can I just ask a follow-on to that Code of Ethics piece? I think, uh, Assistant Commissioner Leahy, your description of a possible huge own goal is, um, is well put. Um, one of the levers we discussed at a previous authority meeting was making it clear to anybody applying for promotion or being promoted that they would have to certify that they had signed. Is that happening? That they had signed the Code of Ethics? People sure. going for promotion to sergeant and inspector, the ones that are nothing to do with us? It's part of the file that, that is considered. It's not dealt with at the interview process specifically. So no, in, I'm thinking about the know. interview. That's, their own, that's your own business. Sure. I'm thinking about the point where you go to appoint somebody. Yes. Is it clear to the candidates that they will not be promoted if they're not prepared to sign the Code of Ethics? I believe so, but I will validate that. I would really that. like to hear yeah. that no, no, confirmed will, in writing. Confirmed to you in writing. If you don't uh, because mind, Because we have two large-scale campaigns. You're aware, I'm sure, yes. of the numbers. And I think it's, it's, it's precisely clear that everybody in the organisation, to AC Leahy's point, should sign for this. And we've tried to lead by example. The queries that were raised about, you know, <coughs> would it be used for disciplinary purposes have been adequately dealt with. I too share the disappointment that we have. I mean, as the year goes on, you will have completed sufficient amount of the training that the training is unlikely to be the reason. Correct. Which is why we're saying there's another step. Is that fair? Yes, that's fair. Thank you. Noel. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner, thank you for your report. I have a number of very brief questions, and Joe, they're probably uh, directly for yourself. First of them is on page four in relation to the, the budget position at the end of, uh, at that, as of today's date. I note that, you know, the Garda College in Templemore now, following the issues we discussed in this forum previously, now has its own dedicated budget. And I'm concerned to read that it's one million over, overspent now and it's attributed to overtime. So what I'd like to know very briefly is what's the cause of that one million overspend at Templemore College on overtime? What action has been taken? What action is planned? And what impact will that have on student Gardaí training and on CPD? And maybe John is yes. a better place Please, John. to... No, thanks, thanks, John. It, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very uh, real number, but the breakdown under it is quite revealing. In the course of the current calendar year, where we're tracking these numbers, the college in totality is underspent, but we had a number of activities we put in there, like stock training which was a particular response to armed service training, not originally in the budget, and that is the single biggest driver of the training overrun. The general admin in the college, in its various line items that are under the subhead that you're talking about, are being extremely well managed by uh, the uh, management staff in the college. So there are additional items that were added in to the 2019 plan, particularly around response areas that have driven that up. The control of, of overtime in the college continues. We have a number of high earners that we're uh, observing and, and monitoring, and we're putting in additional staff to try and bring down the need for overtime in the first instance. And, and HEOs, by the way, as opposed to inspectors. And John, if that, if that one million in overtime arises because of things that weren't anticipated when the budget was set only yes. a few short months ago, what's the relationship between your Garda training plan and the expenditure on overtime in so, so let, let's, let's deal with that because this is a, a subject of really critical importance for Budget 219 as well as the current situation. Leaving aside the cost of establishment and the cost of salaries in the college, the entire discretionary spend on total training for the organisation was about 2.3 million for this current year. 2.3 million. It amounts to about 140 euros per head for the entire organisation. It is so grossly inadequate. And so what we've tried to do is recognise two things. We need a programmed report on managing demand, so we have a realistic demand focus on the level of load that's going to be on training across the organisation, and a commensurate match of resources. Those two have been out of kilter since we got into the government programme of, of foundation training and the MRP, and we're seeking to bring those back in a substantial increase in investment and training and development for 2019. Well, John, in setting the budget for Templemore for 2018, was there a fully, was there a fully costed training plan? No, there wasn't. 
There wasn't. Not? And additional items, Noel, were added to it that were not originally envisaged at the time the budget was set. And what we've done, and I think this is unfortunately, this is, this is endemic or, or, or a cultural trait, there has been tremendous effort made to support programmes, all of the programmes, the additional stretch on the elastic, and what you're seeing is some of that. The irony of it is, on one item alone, stock is 1.1 million, and it's masking an amount of budgetary management that has been on the line items beneath it. So there's been prudential management, if you like, within what was planned, and there's been additional items over and above which were added to the mix. What we will be doing for 2019 is a much more border-defined response to saying this is actually what training capability is. And is, is there a current detailed cost of training plan in Angarda Shikona today? Not for 2018, but there will be for 2019. When, when will that be available to us? We're working on it as we speak for the 2019 budget, and there's correspondence over and back between me and the uh, executive and director. The, the last piece of the question on Templemore: um, What's the impact on on a student on trainee Gardaí in terms of how you're going to recover this one million? Well, the foundation training program is a budgeted item in itself under the total line item, and that's funded and is running well and is being prudentially managed by. But the corrective actions you're having to take at six months point to take a million back out. Will that impact on, on probation, I think trainee, Garthi? No, it won't on the trainee piece, but it's going to imp we have We have essentially three schools. We have a management development school, we have specialist training, and we've got the foundation programme which relates... Where, where's the impact of the one million being clawed back out in six months? I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to tell you that we have a plan that's going to succeed in doing that. I think we're looking at a situation where the additional items, unbudgeted, are going to be in effect extant at the year end. The, the idea that we can simply extract it from the items that were appropriately planned is difficult. you want to add to the overspend? I think the reality is at the halfway point, there are no new additional items possible, and the Chief Superintendent and, and the uh, Director of Finance in the College has been very clear on that. So we're Thank not going to add to it. Th thanks, John. And maybe, Joe, back to you, just for a very brief one. I notice on page um, four of your report, you talk about the towing contract, and you have five divisions that are out to ten are going out to tender. I, I note a comment saying that the Office of, Go of Government Procurement have withdrawn from running the process. Why is that? I, I don't know the answer specifically to that. There, there are technical issues in individual areas. So if, if, if it's acceptable to the chair, we'll write back on the, the specifics around that. I know there are equally some challenges in, in part of this, no one I suspect that may, some of this may be related, but if I can, again, for commercial sensitivity reasons, if I can write to the committee... Yeah, pl please do, because I guess the concern is that when there's a central expertise, that the guards would be then doing something outside of that. So maybe you might clarify that. And, and again, in the interest of time, in terms of the estate management, I note that a new six-year non-renewable lease was signed for the Harcourt Square, which is a critical part of your infrastructure in Dublin. We're now in June 2018, um, and in terms of the reprovision of military road, how confident is Angarda Siakana that you will be in there in December 22, and we won't have the crisis in terms of Harcourt Square that we had some time ago? We're not the delivery agency for military road, just to say that up front, but we are, we, what we have said is we will do everything we can to ensure that um, the of Office of Public Works and associated parties are in a position to, to deliver on that. But to be very clear, the OPW are, are, are adamant on this. There will not be and cannot be an extension to, to Harcourt Square. So there's, a, there's an awareness around the, around the sector that all of the requirements in relation to Military Road will have to be, de will have to be delivered in time. I think as an authority we'd be concerned about the timelines and would want, you know, we'll want to keep in touch with you on that. Just, Finally, just, be, just be clear, I prefer, we are not the delivery agency, a delivery agent for, for the building. Yes, but you are the client and you're the service provider we, that's dependent we, we on. Have, we, have no, we have no control over the procurement, we have no control over the build, we have no control over that at all. So just, just in fairness to us, there are limits to what we can do. What we can do is make sure we will do everything we can to ensure that, you know, that, that the OPW have all the cooperation needed to allow them to meet that. But the question with respect needs to be asked of, of others in terms of delivery. Well, maybe the way I'll ask the question, Joe, is can you flag to us in early course if you have concerns about any other agency not meeting their timelines and impacting on your members and, and, on and the service? And to, to, to be fair to, to everyone involved, at this moment in time, the concerns are, you know, we, we are all aware of the risk. We are all pulling together to achieve the delivery. And I'm not... Today, I cannot say to you that there is a risk, you know, that we have a problem. Thanks. And, and finally then, in terms of training of Garda drivers, um, what, what's your plan? Where are you up to in terms of ensuring that there are adequate number of drivers trained uh, to use blue lights and sirens and that there is a diminishing number driving on a chief's order? 
uh, ongoing discussions between the uh, Assistant Commissioner for Olds Policing and the College around this issue, looking at alternates. And I know we've, we've had a conversation here with the authority around, around the procurement issues um, and, and establishing whether an alternate approach can be taken to that space. I know that there's been active engagement on that issue, but I can't tell you today where we will be in terms of, of, of a new delivery mechanism. But it's something we recognise that for us to continue to deliver, well, it is not possible for us to deliver the scale of training that the organisation needs to meet that. I think we, we just and have to, maybe we have to say that. Who's the file owner at your management team level? Who, who's the owner of this project? So AC Roads Policing is the policy owner for, for the general area. You maybe might ask them to, to write to us and tell, tell us, sure. and we might follow up separately. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Noel. We got the um, RFI this morning, which while we were in session, so we haven't had an opportunity to review it. But um, you can take it that we share your view there. The traditional delivery model hasn't a prayer of catching up with your deficit. So uh, whatever we talk about is going to have to be something that looks a bit different because the deficit is just too big. And we've been talking about it for a while. Um, Judith has a question on the policing plan, I think. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner, I'm sure it hasn't escaped your notice that we have been focusing on detections in the policing committee. And at our last policing committee meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago, AC Finn briefed the committee that he was going to be presenting a detections plan to the next executive meeting. My question is simply, has that presentation happened? And if so, is the plan now being rolled out across the organisation? Um. <clears throat> I think it was for the SLT, uh, uh, he was to, de to deliver for our, our senior leadership team. Um, he still, that still has to be done. Um, the, it has been managed in, in, in primary, uh, the focus on this is by uh, Deputy Toomey, who, who uh, leads out on his, at his crime coordination meeting and has a focus on this in the context of improving our detection rates across the board. Uh, uh, AC Finn took it away to look at it in the context of what uh, was being done, say, in, in the region that he currently works in, and if see if we could uh, get some learning from that to, that we could apply across the board. Uh, that is still an ongoing piece of work. So when is it likely to be presented to the senior leadership team? I would, because we've uh, been waiting for this for quite some time now. Yes. Um, uh, there are a few people that are away on leave at the moment, so it wouldn't be uh, prudent. We have a meeting tomorrow. Uh, but I would expect that by the next meeting we would have it uh, on the agenda for, for, for uh, rollout. When is the next meeting? It's in, in July, early July. Yeah. Thank you. So the July Authority meeting, we might come back to it. Thanks, Judith. Um, I'd now like to move on to our next agenda item, which is in relation to diversity. <coughs> and as I have flagged before, when we prepare for a themed meeting like this, the Authority uh, executive team meet with stakeholders so that they can pre prepare us adequately to ask you hard questions. And I'd like to acknowledge in particular uh, the assistance the staff received and the presence here today of people from Pave Point, from Belonging To, from the Mental Health Ireland and from the National Disability Authority. Uh, I know we found them very helpful in helping us to prepare uh, for this discussion. And the discussion is going to be led initially by Valerie. Okay, thanks Chair. Um, before I move into diversity, there were just two small questions arising out of the Commissioner's report I just wanted to ask. One is, one is actually to give you um, credit for, I think, a very valuable service that's provided that um, often doesn't get recognition and is increasingly important in the protection of our children, and that's the vetting service. And I'm looking at the figures here, and May this year versus May last year, you have about a 20% increase in applications, which I suppose is a credit to the level of voluntary working and we're at that time of year when, when we're heading with this lovely weather into all sorts of summer projects for kids and everything that goes with it. I'm just wondering if you've got anything you'd like to say um, that would give the public assurance in terms of turnaround times because I would be aware that there's often concern out there when vetting is required and, and uh, organisations and youth groups are waiting for it. Would you like to comment on that? Well, I know, um, Valerie, that... Um the turnaround times are, are down to an all-time low. There's a matter of days now where this turnaround can happen. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not always uh, the people who process the applications in the first instance. They come to us on block from other agencies. But once they reach our, our vetting uh, unit, 
they are turned around very, very. Um, so, the, so that's so. Uh, so the section is dealing with a greater number of applications, but still, still getting them out in a tight yes. turnaround time. Yes, you'll be aware that the vetting okay. was introduced. And, I just uh, want to congratulate yeah, you on yeah, that because yeah. sometimes these are the operations that, that don't get the headlines, don't get credit, and I think it's very reassuring for members of the public out there who may be waiting for a vetting process to be completed to hear that. So, I just want to acknowledge that. Um, Okay, moving into the diversity area, it was another question actually that arose from your report um, and be before I get into the general area of diversity. I note in your tendering uh, procurement uh, report there within your report, you've a tender out for interpreters. Um, is this just language interpreters and does it include sign, la sign language? I, I don't know. You don't know? I don't know offhand. It's something we'd be interested in and maybe, maybe come back to us on that. Um, okay, just opening it up into the general areas we said, we, we all know that Ireland's changed rapidly in recent years in terms of the, pop, the makeup of the population. We're more diverse than ever. Um, I'd, like to address, I'd like to address a few areas, so just to give you the heads up, first of all, the, the composition of your workforce. I'd like to talk about what your current and future strategy and plans are around your, your, your people objectives, opportunities presented in the recruitment process and career progression. So those are the areas <coughs> I'll be covering and some of my colleagues will go into other areas. But just to open up, how would you, generally speaking, characterise the, con the, 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 the response of the Garda Síochána in a changing Ireland, given that public confidence in policing is often enhanced if the service represents the community that it serves? In the, in the what's, your, what's your response in policing to meeting the needs of a more diverse community out there? Well, obviously knowing those communities is essential and I think we've done great work on that. There's a few things that can happen. There's the, there's the makeup of our own organisation, first of all, in the context of, of the people that we have at our disposal uh, to go into those communities. And then there's um, uh, the, the spread of those communities throughout our, uh, our, our country. Uh, and how we manage those on an ongoing basis. Uh, and I think um, over the years uh, we have been, um, I suppose, to the forefront in the context of our uh, ethnic liaison officers and ensuring that uh, as these communities started to build in our, in our gathered divisions that we had trained people who could go in and ensure that that community uh, got uh, very early, uh, I suppose, knowledge in the context of what the, the Irish Police Service is there to do. Uh, and that happened, and I know th uh, that I was uh, instrumental in some of that work 10 years ago in the context of which were, it was then a priority of our policing plans, where we had a huge influx of people and, and, uh, and ethnic minorities from, from, from right around uh, Europe and the world. Uh, and I know Dave is here today, and he uh, has first-hand knowledge of what that looks like on the ground in the context of the importance of that first step that we are seeing to be a service that people can trust, that people can come to uh, and discuss whatever issues they have and that we're there for their services as well as any other aspect. Now, the limitations of that then is understanding those ethnic uh, groups and some of the uh, you know, unique uh, aspects of their cultures and how we actually uh, prepare for that. And in that context as well, I think lots of good work has happened uh, in ensuring that our own people, that the current stock people we have at our disposal are fully aware of those cultural differences. Uh, but if we were to make it even better, we would have a representative sample of those ethnic minority groups in our service itself. So it's a double challenge. That, um, that brings me to yeah. the first area I wanted to open up with you and maybe with your colleagues as well. I, and I know the challenge you have in terms of information systems, etc. cetera. What, what, kind of, um, what kind of information do you have about your own um, employee set to help you on this? And how would you characterise the current diversity of the Garda workforce, recognising yes, the legacy, etc.? Yeah, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Valerie, I think this has been um, a really interesting set of, of questions. We have uh, taken a real serious look over the last six months in particular, began it, I think, about November of last year, looking at the diversity agenda, prompted in some respects by dialogue with yourselves, and examined the composition of the workforce. The data sets that we have on the nine pillars of diversity really are strongest only in two, which would be gender uh, and age. We have some data around the other seven, but it's patchy and voluntary. So any responses I give to you are in the context of a recognition that we have that we're going to build by voluntary request, because that's what it has to be, a more robust picture of the organization. 
But following the moves in, in the autumn of last year, we had a number of initiatives. We engaged in a series of focus groups with about 60 people across the organization as a way of testing what it is they feel about the lived experience of our commitment to EDI, diversity and inclusion, and equality within the organization. And we got a bit of a wake-up call in some of the key data that we, don't, that we don't have and some of the barriers. And so I'd be pleased to talk to that. But the composition of our workforce right now, I can give you detail on two of the nine pillars with some certainty and specificity and indicators across the rest. And we've got patchy data, which I think you've acknowledged. And I, 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 think I mean, we understand that. But I, I, think, I think we know already that on the gender breakdown, you have about 26% female. Um, whereas I believe in the population at the moment, women are majority at the moment. But um, is, that, is that an improvement from previous years? Where does that compare, say, to 10 years ago? Well, in 19, uh, Chief will come through the numbers, but just to give you three data points very crisply yeah. and at just a top level. In 1990, 21% yeah. was the gender female male mix, 21, uh, uh, 79 in, uh, in the organisation. Uh, we moved it up to... Um, originally 26 in the commencement point of, of recruiting in this recent time, and our most recent data from the most recent intake of, of the organization has seen that go to 28, 29% as a more. So, so it's climbing. It's climbing. Okay. But, okay. But, but I think, to be honest, and, and I think we're coming at this with some brutal honesty, um, the reasons for this have been very revealing in that the life cycle for a female guard within the organization, the life cycle for a male, is actually different. So some of the dive that we've done under this has been revealing, and we are working to understand it in a greater level of granularity. Okay, but on the recruitment front, you're telling me that it's climbing. It's climbing. Slightly, but climbing. climbing. And the other, the other um, category you were going to address, the gender is the first one. Gender, well, we, we know the age, 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 age the distribution in the yeah. organization. That's been a function of regulation. We've seen people at an older age now in the last recruitment yeah. series of recruitment campaigns coming in up to 35 is the current regulation that uh, governs that but you know there is a reality to what you're saying in terms of the composition of the workforce we reflect in large measure middle ireland okay i want to move on to recruitment just very quickly to answer we're we're, we're awaiting the hr strategy yes. and the diversity strategy i presume those those are those are two blended documents speak together. to each other. Fortunately. They're, they're flagged green in the, re the commissioner's report, which, which means are... they're going to come in tomorrow, John. Is that? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> or we'll have a bit more I'm red in that sensitive. report. Okay, we're, we're looking forward to that, obviously. No, no um, I think I hope you'll be impressed when they moving into recruitment. I mean, you, you've had a period of accelerated recruitment. You've had 800 guard, the 800 guard a year, 500 civilians a year. So, and there's a specific commitment in this year's policing plan to attract and recruit applicants from minority groups, from diverse groups. And women aren't a minority group, by the way, oh, but let's, no, let's, they're, they're minority majority. represented as such. That's not currently being met. Um, so how have you approached the rec recruitment campaigns? What is it you've done differently to get this small climb you've achieved in the gender piece? Have you achieved progress in the other areas? So, and has it delivered? Has it delivered? I would say it is delivering, but slowly. Uh, it is a situation right now where, in our analysis of this question, we have recognized a number of key points, and they're in three pillars. The first is that I think we need to make certain that our outreach, the kind of work that is done uh, with schools, with universities, with intro offices, we've started to go and visit what were, in effect, uh, social welfare labor exchange, uh, locations, interfaith groups, uh, building up on public events, open days at stations. These carry a message about an inclusive and guarded Shia And we're trying to build, if you like, this outreach to whether it's Bloom or places you'd have seen us around the country in a real targeted way, trying, for example, to pay attention to schools where there may be more New Irish than there are, if you like, the Middle Ireland group that we speak to. Girls' schools talking about careers in Ungarda Siakana, wherein we are trying to increase that number in a targeted way. So there's a targeted outreach and influence piece to what uh, we're doing and we're going to intensify. And how, how are you monitoring that? I'm curious about your use of social media. I know you've had Facebook and video, your YouTube channel, etc. So you, 
I presume have, according to what we hear everywhere, you have a wealth of data in terms of who has viewed. We have. So you had something like, I don't have the figure written down here somewhere, but a huge number of hits on your Facebook page, you had very high engagement with your face, Facebook question and answer session, very high engagement in your YouTube video channel. What's that telling you about the people who are getting to that stage? And what's, what do you know about the conversion rate of that interest to actual applications? That is, that is, a, that is the essence of what we're, we're trying to bottom out on in this, in this approach. We've had, as you said, 500,000 hits between Twitter and our, our Facebook page. We went out in 12 languages in the most recent campaign. Aside from English, the second most uh, sought-after language uh, version was, was Arabic. 10,200 hits. So when you look at the, the media effect that we've, we've had, and again, whether this is translating into real application remains to be seen in many respects. Can you tell that at this point, the current campaign, the most recent campaign is closed. How soon will you get an analysis of that well, data to compare there's a, with there's your... There's a complication that arises there. We, we have under uh, obligation, we, we use the public appointment service. They do not provide us with the ethnicity data around the kinds of questions you're asking me, either, either on country of origin or on ethnic origin, in their response to us. And they're precluded from doing so. So we are then required to factor this back into a survey. Can so I not give you a, an anonymized report that no. is an individual? OK, so you will, at the end of the competition, know who lands in Templemore, so you'll be able to do a comparison. At we that will, point. And, and this is and the point. there are other variables. Coming back to the Facebook page, so you can analyse at least the interest yes. that's been shown. Um, have you compared and have you worked with, with? I know we had a conversation at our last private meeting, and we talked about, for example, New, New Zealand police force recruitment Facebook page. Is, uh, ha, is there an opportunity for you to to to, um, to maybe work with other police forces and learn from them in terms of how they analyse that Facebook wealth of data that we all now know so much about? So, uh, on foot of that discussion, um, and we had seen the, the excellent piece put together by New, New Zealand Police, and in fact in the whole EDI strategy, we've looked to other police forces around the world, Western Australia, uh, a number of UK, Scotland, we've been in a dialogue with a range of these in a way that it's deepened our understanding of the topic. And, and I suppose a difference between diversity and inclusion, which we'll come to later on. But on foot of your prompting, we worked with Spark Foundry, who are a, an organisation that help the effectivity of uh, e-media outreach to try and begin the process of saying, how can we move from what I think you described somewhat accurately, I would have to say, a fairly banal uh, radio message. I'm sure I, I'm sure I didn't say that, John. I, I, no, no, but that, I, I'm, <laughs> I I'm, I'm interpreting you <laughs> with honesty here, Valerie. Um, but, but truthfully, I mean, we, we saw it ourselves. The vast bulk of the impacts that we've had did come through social media in yeah. terms of how the 4,776 respondents who said how it is they came to view our stuff did so through social media. But Spark have given us some guidance on, I suppose, the thought process of making valid and visible the kind of exciting careers that do exist within an Garish economy. And I think Bob called us out on this. We're not, we're not using the materials as effectively as we have them to demonstrate the range of, of activity. And so while we're certainly dealing with the language challenge, that kind of excitement that was conveyed in the New Zealand police video that involved everybody from the commissioner sitting at a desk out in the middle of the country, it, we, we've got to do that. And I think Gen X and Gen Y, the, the millennial generation, needs to see Ungarda Siakona differently. So that's, that's where we've gone and sought external help. Um, Bob okay. brought a production eye to it. I think, I think right. it's really reassuring that you're exploring these new ways. And yep. it, it's, I suppose, maybe just slightly disappointed that it's late in the current recruitment campaign. But there'll be more recruitment campaigns, and I'm sure that'll progress. There was, I think, a recent GRA article that referred to th this lack of diversity in recruitment as a ticking time bomb. A reaction to that well, description. I, I'm, I'm going to quote the policing authority to itself here, and, and uh, I don't know whether that's a safe or a dangerous thing to do, but the reality <laughs> of the numbers is clear. We have uh, a, a, an annual uh, retirement rate which is fairly stable. Uh, it's actually going to decline a little bit in the coming years, and then it's going to tick up. And we can see that and project that, and you'll see that in our workforce plan document. We also know that in the process of building up to the 15,000 target from government, 
that we are at the end of this year going to be somewhere of the order of 14,100 guards. So we're going to be into completing that segment of our recruitment build and then annually it will be a retirement situation, to, if you like, a maintenance situation. So the chief and the team have looked at this and we've, we've, we've seen that we have done an amount of intensive recruitment. We haven't moved the needle substantially and I will be the first one to acknowledge this, we haven't moved the needle substantially around this key agenda. We've done an amount of very good work in brand building with communities in terms of explaining to, I suppose, new Irish and second generation that Ungarda Síochána represents a very good place to have a diversity of career. And with the AC and, and, and the work done by Dave, we have really begun to cross-fertilise the message of outreach to communities and careers in Ungarda Síochána. In, in, in ensuring that you can measure your success, what are you going to do about this issue of data, of gathering? I know it's a challenge that faces all companies. Yep. If, if, you know, do you have a plan in place to get a voluntary declaration, declaration from applicants yeah. and from employees? One of our action points from, from the strategy that has been developed will be exactly that. We will do uh, an exercise in self-declaration and we probably will repeat it, not necessarily annually, but every two years to keep that up to date. So that's, that's what we plan to do. I think it would be very important to baseline even at this stage so, so you know where you're at. Yeah, Moving on to then when post-recruitment, and you, you've, you said you're getting the 21%, 26 up to 28 in, in terms of gender. That's improving. There's obviously a more diverse age recruitment, and I think part of that is probably the backlog during the non-recruitment years, but it's given you, I suppose, the benefit of both an age mix and an experience mix coming into the organisation. So that, that's all good. Um, Career progression then within the organisation, I don't have the exact stats in front of me, but it, it would appear from the data that Ngarda Síochána is still behind other police forces and I think well behind other Irish public sector organisations. And I'm, I'm going to focus particularly on gender here in terms of progression through the ranks to senior roles. Um, what measures are you taking to ensure that women are progressing? At a, at a comparable rate to, to the men in the organisation, but also to other organisations, given who face the same societal, societal challenges, Challenge. but seem to get over them better? The first measure we're, we, we're going to do, um, well, the first thing we have done is to look at the data that we have to see what is, what is the actual story at the moment, and we have that data now. And the story is that as you go through the ranks, there is um, a pretty significant fall off. There's a big drop off, yeah. yeah. In, which, which, which isn't happening to the same degree in other Irish public sector yeah. organisations, even those that may be non, yeah. so, you know, traditionally male professions, shall we say. Yeah. But the first thing we have to do is to understand the problem as to why that is happening. Yeah. Is it, a, is it a, a factor of numbers? Not necessarily, because we're not getting the numbers through the ranks that we have in the organisation or proportion of it. So we've got to understand why, just to look at gender specifically, as to why the the, um, the, our female colleagues are not getting through the ranks or why they're not necessarily applying to get through the ranks in the same rate as their male colleagues. So we've got to understand that problem is the reason why. Once we understand that problem, then we'll be in a better position to be able to address it. But what is it you're doing to try and understand we that? Are, the first thing we're going to look at, we're going to look at a number of competitions. We're going to go back historically to a competition that, and, and speak to the people uh, of that age group or of that, of that cohort of people who would have been eligible at that time and ask them, well, why is it that you did not apply when you were eligible to apply? We are going to speak to a, gro a broad section of, of, of our staff to see, OK, on a general basis, what's your view of career progression, of promotion, or lateral moves as well, because some people don't necessarily want to get promoted. They're quite happy to get into a, a detective branch or another branch and to understand why, that's if there are barriers, why are they? It's not necessarily gender-specific, though. No, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So, um, do you have any hypothesis that you're testing in this work? Not at the moment, but we are going to. Yeah. There is one, Valerie, that we kicked around, and it's not very data founded yet, but it's it's proving to have some attraction, and that is that if you look at the life cycle of uh, a female guard member, there is a general tendency that they will, you know, work to full retirement, but not very much beyond it and that it's the 30 year and out. And we're, we're the, the working hypothesis that we need to test is, this very clearly refers to family uh, I suggest, engagement. John, that that longitudinal kind of view might not be valid. The 55 year old today may not be the 55 year old that the 30 year old today is going to be. I, I, I would think you're absolutely right. 
And I think the, the, other, the other overlay on this that I think is really interesting is that when you examine the um, non-application for promotion or lateral moves, even as the Chief said, there are situations where other policy areas come to impact, like allocate away. So, you know, Garda Barrett is promoted to sergeant or inspector more likely or superintendent, and there's an allocate away from point of uh, original service. And these allocations are family disruptive. So this we're, applies to men and women. Yes, it, it does. Yeah. It does. But it would more likely impact the hypothesis, to your, to your point. It's a really good question. It has a different impact, if you like, in the traditional home situation. And that women may decide that this arrangement... Okay, is, do you have evidence that... No, no, and I'm saying that, we, this, is, that, this is the chief point we okay, need to explore. Because that's the sort explore. of hypothesis is, that I suppose it, in a new Ireland needs to be tested. Exactly. Okay. We to, agree it needs to be tested. To what degree does deployment, a person's assignment within the organisation, impact on their success, success in promotion competitions? Are you going to look at that? Well, <laughs> chief, do you want to... Well, well, one of the, well, we have a number of we have a number of solutions that we can offer to try and address the figures that we have, but, and they may or may not work. But we've got to be sure to understand the, the the problem that is there from from the individual's perspective as to why they're not getting through the ranks. Allocation may well be one of them, uh, and in recent allocations on the last promotion course. Uh, the last pro successful promotion competition in 2014, we did take a, 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 a view and a strategic view with the, under the behest of the Commissioner to ensure that as far as possible when you were promoted, you had to move from the station you were in, but you were going to go to the adjoining division in as far as was possible. And by and large we achieved that. To, uh, there are some, some exceptions to it, we achieved it. So we, we anticipate then that there might, we, might get a, we might get a bounce from that in terms of the number of people who applied this time around. And we have the highest number, and I'm not <coughs> saying categorically that there is a correlation between this, but we do have the highest number of applicants for Garth the Sergeant rank ever this year. Hopefully what we did that time had an impact on it. We, we, scientifically we can't prove that, but we might have been. So there are the types of things that we need to be mindful of. Some, you mentioned societal um, influences, and every organisation is affected like this. Um, but but organisations <coughs> recognise that it's in the organisation's interest that you have gender equality or Absolutely. gender diversity at a senior level. So um, male or female at certain times in life, promotion sure. mightn't be an immediately attractive option. Um, what, what are you doing as an organisation to address that issue? That there are times in lives when anybody, man or woman, might feel, I, I can't go for promotion now, it doesn't suit me now, for whatever domestic reasons. But to get those really, that really good talent back on that career ladder again. It, will, this, will this be addressed in the HR strategy? It, it is addressed in the HR strategy. And there's three pillars that I would refer the authority to that we've just referred to. The first one, that we're going to have targeted influence and outreach to the communities that, that represent New Ireland most especially. The also, we also, the second pillar that I think is really critical, and this goes to what you're, you're referring to, Valerie, is the removal of barriers to greater diversity. And we have a number of barriers, like the allocate away arrangement that, that the Chief talked about, the issues that we have to deal with around family-friendly and flexibility activities. There are issues around symbols, whether you know uniform or oath that may be you know, keeping certain groups from applying for our, our uh, organisation. There's the issue of shift work, and that is where essentially every guard coming through Templemore begins on the regular shift. We've also got to recognise, and I think you've just called... Just on, on the shift and the roster, yep. there are other organisations. Look at nurses, <laughs> predominantly women. Um, yep. they, 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 they have women senior managers. They have rosters which are even less predictable, I gather, than Garda rosters. So... Are you working on getting over these barriers, or are you saying we accept these as reasons? The, the final bullet in the document I'm looking at here before me, Valerie, it speaks to we need to build a positive narrative that's solution-based around this. Um, we, there, there is, specific to the Ungarish Econ organisation and maybe to other frontline responders, is we've got to deal with issues in that narrative like perception of risk and other issues that are unique to us. So the journey that we've taken on in examining the barriers We've got that from the focus groups that we ran in, in the spring of this year. We have to take now a very real effort to try and make scientific the weight to be associated with these things so that we can begin 
to, to change the lived experience okay. and, and, and hopefully make it more I've been, I've been told to, to cut off here I, I, maybe on another meeting we might come back as we haven't mentioned the, the non guard the, the civilian yeah. population here at all yet it, it might also be helpful when you're giving us HR data that if you can at all split it, split it by gender from now on just so we can yeah. see these trends. whether it's the redeployments the promotions, etc. If we include the civilian, uh, our civilian colleagues, uh, the, the ratio goes up to 34% yes. uh, of, yes. of females. Yes. And other yes. police forces, including New Zealand, when, you can't, when, they, when they give you their data, they include everybody in the data as a breakdown. Now, of course, you've got to make sure that you get a representation on the front line, on the visibility <coughs> piece as well, that is reflective of society, because that's what people see. Okay. Yeah. Look, I think we, we've heard you're doing a lot of work on this, so we'll, look at the, we'll watch that with, with great interest, um, because it's in, I think it's in, in the organisation's interest, quite apart from supporting your people. And Chair, if, if I could say, we would welcome an engagement around some of these nuttier points that are, need to be unravelled with the, with the policing authority, because okay. it's, it's fascinating, and I think it really has an impact on acceptability. Shouting my name over here, was it? <laughs> Just, me. Just very briefly, Valerie. Nice to come in and then I'll be letting Bob Collins in. And I think it might answer or address some of the questions you had. When we looked at the data very, very recently, we saw that when, when uh, women present uh, for the first time that can go for promotion at sergeant level, they actually represent the uh, variation in the organisation, the ratio in the organisation. So you'll have 23 or 24 percent are presenting for interview for sergeant and they're being successful at the same rate. You know, as it translates into the promotion. But when we look at the inspector and the superintendent, it drops to about 7% and then 5% presenting for interview. It's an interesting stat because in the Irish public sector, really generally, is. the success rate is higher among women who apply than it is among men who and, apply. But what we men can, being more optimistic, apparently. <laughs> we can actually identify the individuals involved over a number of years. And okay. the research that we need to engage in is to sit down and interview, do a bit of qualitative research around this and find out what was it that changed between the first time they presented you know, and, and everybody was up to go uh, reflecting the ratio in the organisation to such a significant drop at the next two stages? Okay. And I think if we get some yeah. uh, life engagement, it will answer a lot of our questions. That is unusual if, if your participation rate and success rate for women are the same. And that's not to do with public sector, that is international. Yeah. There is literature, as long as your arm, about low participation and high success. So you might have a look at a bit of comparative data while you're at it. Yeah, it gives us, it gives us loads of hooks. Just that piece of research we've done allows us to go into a real piece of research, uh, you know, but there's lots of questions that can be answered in there, you know, by engaging with the individuals themselves. Thank you. Thanks. Bob. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I was a bit baffled by <coughs> uh, John, John Barrett's uh, observation that... Um, the work that was done last uh, November, at the end of last year, was a wake-up call. Um, because it seems to me that this story is as old as time. Uh, and that the change in the composition of the population of this state began at the, the end of the last century, the beginning of this century. And the particular growth be, it was in 2004. And the Garda Sheikhan's diversity strategy in 2009 um, if, if you leave aside the, the language of the era in which it was written, wasn't a bad document and had many really interesting um, targets and elements identified in it. But the new Ireland also contains the old Ireland in the sense that the, the traditional, if you want to use that term, population. But they weren't always entirely well represented in the Garda Shikona, even before diversity as we know it now became a feature of our lives. And we haven't touched on the issue of social class or um, demographic, uh, socioeconomic um, circumstances. <coughs> we haven't talked about uh, the LGBT community. We focused particularly on gender, and that's not unimportant, it's, ex it's exceedingly important. But I'm, as I say, a little baffled by the fact that this seems to have come as a surprise at the end of last year. I mean, one of the considerations is that expectation influences engagement and experience influences expectation. And it's not entirely surprising that certain categories of people, and this is not, this is not unique to the Garda Shikona, would feel that they weren't going to be 
well represented in circumstances where they are arguably not represented at all at the moment. Well, Bob, maybe I, I need to begin by clarifying what I said. We have a public attitude survey which gives an indication, uh, an ongoing measure of how it is the public is responding to the organisation that we, we are part of. And if I look at the experience, starting with Staines and what he said about acceptability, we have had good relations, I think, with our communities generally, and I think we've had you know, an availability and accessibility piece. There's been no McPherson in Ireland. There's been public confidence expressed. But when we got, and, and what I was seeking to convey, and forgive me if I didn't do it appropriately, when we began to look at the kinds of issues, in fact, I'm in violent agreement with you, when we went down the nine pillars of diversity as called out with ethnicity specifically for travellers in, in the Irish context, we saw the degree to which we have work to do. And that against a backdrop of a very high level of public acceptability for the work done by Ungarda Siakana. So on the one hand, we had a good news story. And when we began to drill into the data, to your point, one, we didn't have the robust kind of data to rely upon with any certainty. So we do have, for example, on one of our systems, people can volunteer their religious orientation. That's true. When you take out the table of the 10 most populous religious adherents in Ireland, we essentially have nobody from anything from the third one down. It's, it's that kind of wake-up call that you're talking about. But, but let me say about the two decades, because I think you're absolutely right. We're charting this to Celtic Tiger 1995 and forward in, in the sociological backdrop that we've put together with this. And in that period of time, I think it's fair to say, we didn't move with the trend and change in modern Ireland. And the determination from the commissioner down is to ensure that we up our game to inclusion. And we've had a big debate in the organization about what's diversity and what's inclusion. We need to be inclusive and reflective of modern Ireland. Yes, but the, the debate about a shift to inclusion is usually predicated on the fact that representation has been significantly advanced. And except in the case of gender, where 26.5% you know, is commendable, it's, it's not uh, on a par with some of the nearest neighbours of the Garda Síochána, but it's, it's not to be deprecated, and I don't. The issue, as, as has already been canvassed by, by Valerie, is that that representation is not reflecting itself in the more senior ranks. And there are differences. Men, in general, believe that they are capable of doing any job more senior to the one they hold. Women, by and large, do not have the same expression of confidence, even though, in my experience, their capacity is usually greater than that of the men who believe they have the capacity. And it requires work to be done to change it. And looking at 14 people, two of whom are female, um, and I don't, me, I'm not making a facetious point, but that is not an indifferent consideration in relation to the way in which people look at the prospect of, of career decisions. And was I wrong if I detected what might be considered to be some degree of implicit sexism in the sense that women aren't represented because they have a different approach to their life cycle or they have a greater concern no. with, no. with family Bob, or childcare? I, I, because I, I presume would, that many I, I male would, guards have That is the hypothesis we want to well. test. That is a hypothesis we want to test. It's not a statement of fact. The, the word test is really important in this. We need to examine the degree to which that does or does not influence what is a pattern, and we can, we can stand over this pattern because it's data-driven, that the probability on achieving 30 years service in Ungarda Síochána by somebody who is female is likely to lead to a retirement shortly thereafter versus the more likely situation for people at Garda rank staying on longer above 30 years if they're male. That's, that's the data that we need to test. And, and to, to the Chief's point, we need to do a, a, a lived experience survey and sit with those folks and say, why was it that you retired? Or why was it that you didn't apply for promotion or an alternative lateral move within the organisation? I wonder whether, Commissioner, you have a view, thanks, sorry, thank you, John, whether you have a view as to the implications for a policing organisation 
whose composition doesn't reflect the changing nature of the community that it's policing? Well, doesn't reflect. Um, I think I go back to the two aspects of service in the first instance to the community and then those delivering the service. And I think if we look at the work we've done in the service area for our, our uh, diverse community, we see that there's a very good example of a very good approach. And that's where we sow the seed. And we can have as many um, you know, media campaigns and everything else, and, but, and I'm not an expert on that, but and who, who would advise on that. But I think the most productive way of increasing our diversity within our ranks is to increase our level of service to, the, to, that, to those diverse groups. And I think that uh, is an approach that we have been very successful in in the context of ensuring that those communities feel part of the Irish, uh, uh, I suppose, state and, and, uh, and Irish citizenry, and that they can trust the police service that is available to them. That piece of work has taken some time, and you have spoke about the diversity plan that you saw from some years ago. Uh, and what that aspired to. Uh, in that, like I accept we are where we are in the context of wh what we have within our ranks, uh, but I think, um, you know, if we are to, to improve on that, and I know, even though we don't have any figures to give you or, or, or in the context of how many from each different uh, ethnic minority have, have, have come through our, our doors in the past while, that is an improving picture. Anecdotally, and from what my experience of going to passing out parades and knowing the people that I meet, that they are starting to, to come to us. Uh, and uh, I think that's due in no small part to the amount of effort that has gone in at community level uh, from the people who currently serve in our organisation. How an increase in that makeup and diversity across our ranks would further improve that in the context of people looking at a service and saying, that's something that I can aspire to because look, uh, we have people in that group that come from my background and my, my nationality. So, um, of course, I would like to be in a position, uh, Bob, to say you know that we are we are that we're we're approaching that. Uh, what I am confident of is that the investment we've made will bear fruit for us uh, over the coming years if we continue with the good work that Dave McInerney and his people do in the context right around the country of ensuring those communities feel that they, can, uh, that they, they see us as uh, a service they can deal with. Uh, and I'll come back to one aspect of that in a, in a moment, if I may. I mean, a, 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 an axiom of policing is that um, every contact leaves a trace. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe every trace needs a contact in the sense that if people are going to feel genuinely that the policing service is part of their lives that they need to see themselves reflected or at least to be, be confident uh, that the policing sensitivity includes them. And I just wonder whether you have a judgment as to whether communities that are, or groups that are underrepresented, and I'm not confining this, as I said a moment ago, to ethnic uh, groups, do you think they trust uh, that the Garda Síochána will be able to serve them and be fully understanding of their own circumstances? Um, I'd say that is definitely an improving picture, and I can, I can, I, I can, but I'll give you my own experience because that's all I can talk to in this context. As being an officer in, in divisions and districts around this country where we did go into those communities, and there was a huge level of mistrust, in, and the, I'm going back 10, 15 years, of these newly arrived people into our country who just had very bad experiences in wherever they came from with the police. And it took a period of time. Uh, and, you know, uh, I could sense the level, even <coughs> in a very, uh, you know, over a long period of time, I could sense how that trust was building because we did bring them in, we did ask them, we did spend time having those conversations. And that's what needs to happen. It continues to happen. But we're now coming into a stage where we are going into generation, that, that generation that I dealt with 15 years ago now have offspring who are starting to come into an age where they may consider 
on Gad Shikhana as a, as, as, a, as a career option for themselves. Uh, so I think the work that we did then should begin to bear fruit for us now. And, and I would say that the level of trust was not there uh, in large sections of those ethnic minorities at the time. But uh, because of the work we have done, I would feel that that, should, should, uh, that has changed. And simply to say, just uh, on <coughs> passing in response to that, I was at a regional launch of the Ethics Code um, a couple of weeks ago, and there were some interesting things uh, said about the way in which um, local uh, superintendents uh, engage with um, new arrivals in the community, open days in Garda stations and so on, which was, which was very encouraging. Which brings me to... Well, before I come to that point, are you confident in as much as any of us can be confident of any uncertainty, are you confident that there is sufficient sensitivity within the organisation and in Garda stations around the country? That if somebody from a substantially underrepresented community becomes a member of the Garda Sheikhana, that they will be able to be themselves that they will be able to retain their distinctiveness and they won't, they won't feel under peer pressure to bend over backwards to be the same as everybody else and then diminish the value that they could bring to the organisation <coughs> in terms of reaching out to communities. Yes, I, I'd say I am confident, based on my own experience again, uh, and I can't speak for every uh, division of the country or every, or, or every uh, place we have uh, ethnic minorities, which is now in every county and district in the country. Uh, I would be confident, yes. Uh, that they would be, be accepted, yes, in the context and, and of coming into a, an organisation. Uh, I, I don't want to... I, 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 it's difficult not to specify, but I don't want to specify in this context. Mm. But if a traveller, and there are, I know there are travellers who are guards, but if, if a member of the traveller community becomes a guard, do you think that person, she or he, will be able to retain their own sense of engagement with their own community uh, and not, as I say, feel they should bend over backwards and be the same as uh, their colleagues in the, in the station or in the district? Yes, I'd be confident that that would be uh, good. Achievable, yeah. Can I turn to the area of the, the res where responsibility lies within the organisation for um, this issue of diversity? Um, is it, the, the, and I know the, the, particularly the good work that David McInerney does, and it's not just because you're here that I say that, but that uh, your fame precedes you, but that is clear. But is that same level of engagement replicated across the organisation? And is there the same level of expectation from other parts? Because the danger is always, in respect of every issue, that if one person or one section has responsibility, then the rest of the organisation feels exempt. And there's a sufficient evidence to demonstrate the, the results of that, not just, and I'm not talking about the guards in this case. And there's also the risk that if the person or a key people leave or move, that the quality of the service collapses or even that the person won't be allowed to leave simply because of the potential consequences. Do you worry about that? Yeah, of course I worry, not just in this area, Bob, but across the board. We have plenty, lots of areas of, of specialism and uh, where we have very good people doing excellent work. And it is very important that we have uh, succession plans in place and I can see when, uh, when, when people are ending... Uh, supporting their careers as well in the context if they want promotion or want to go somewhere else, that that, that would be allowable uh, without diminishing the level of service uh, that is available uh, through that office at any given time. Uh, so this is not unique to the area we're discussing, uh, but it's very important to realise that we do have a national network in the context of uh, reach, reaching into communities right around the country. I think we do need uh, a central office that... Uh, they can sound off in the context of uh, what's best practice and, and ensuring that we get this, the highest standards being, being um, I suppose, uh, understood and then uh, distributed throughout our organisation. Uh, so that, uh, you know, given the many, many multi-areas that we have to cater to, 
that you know, when it comes to um, uh, achieving high standards in whatever aspect of our work, that we have someone that can call us and say, call us out and say, you know, we have a network, but we're working better in some places than others, and we need to do, and that's a continuous challenge. It, it, it will be. And uh, there are many benefits, uh, as we know, from having, and John and, and our crime people are here in the context of having, having that level of uh, expertise at a, at a national level, which can be replicated, and we're doing it in lots of other areas across the board, uh, having that level of expertise then uh, cascaded into our regions, where you have the local people doing their work at a very high standard, but have, always have uh, somewhere to go back to in the context of checking whether or not they're at the, at the, at the level they should be, and vice versa, having that national office going into those uh, areas and offices to ensure that those people who are assigned that task that are doing it to the best uh, uh, highest standard. Thank you. And the, I suppose it is a related question, uh, um, and uh, depend on the chair to tell me when to um, stop. Uh, the issue of outreach, the way in which the organisation engages with and deepens the sets of relationships with, as I say, and this is not just about ethnic minorities, important though they be, it's about all of those areas that are underrepresented, and I refer again in particular to the issue of class because that is a reality in, in our lives, and there is a substantial underrepresentation of people uh, from working class areas or um, particular socioeconomic um, categories everywhere, uh, not just the Garda Sheikhana. And I just wonder how the outreach embraces that or engages with that. Can I just make the point, Bob, first of all, there is an amount of work, as the Commissioner said, going on in the general topic, and, and recently just one anecdote that is, is data-driven. Um, Chief Superintendent Wes Cork conducted a survey of the number of nationalities that live in the town area of Ballancolic, which I remember as relatively small and innocuous as a child. There are now 30,000 people living there in 72 nationalities, and he is part of our research in trying to understand the changing of Ireland. But to your specific point, I think socioeconomic challenges have been very influential in the way in which we've looked at access to training and access to the organisation. There was a long debate as to whether or not people should come to the organisation with certain training done, like a driving licence, like being able to swim, like having a first aid course done. And the view in the recruitment campaign that began second last was that that would have been discriminatory or difficult for people who were economically challenged. So we are not perhaps representative in the way that perhaps we should be of the full expanse of the Irish socioeconomic <coughs> grid. But we do consider these matters in relation to criteria for entry. Uh, Bob, if I might just uh, address some of the issues you've, you, you've raised there, and indeed Valerie raised them earlier on in terms of uh, engagement with the diverse communities across uh, uh, Ireland. If we look back to the early 2000s, you know, when we first set up the office that Dave, Dave heads now, and we sent out our, our ethnic liaison officers you know, in around 2000 and 2001, it, it, it could be described as a kind of an emergency response to the changing demographic of Ireland at the time, and it was a very effective response at the time. Is it still as effective? I would think no, it's not as effective as it was then because the demographic has changed and we're going into second generation people, you know, and, and they're a very, very different mix and their expectations are very, very different. Over the years, and you asked the question, have we relied too heavily on Dave McInerney in his office? Absolutely we have. You know, uh, and, and in fairness, and, and I have to give him his, his proper title, Dr. Dave McInerney, and I say that because his PhD is in this area, this specific area, and we have relied too heavily on Dave over the years. And when we needed to resource it to deal with the changing challenges that we were being faced with, you know, we haven't kept up. We haven't kept pace with that. And Donald is right in terms of the community guards that have run out on the ground and the ELOs that were out there, fabulous people that have, you know, kept our heads above the waterline in terms of integrating uh, with communities, but we need a far more structured approach to it now. You know, in terms of collecting data, in terms of penetrating communities that we wouldn't uh, previously have seen as a diverse community. Okay. You know, the nature of the challenge has changed, 
and we have to change with it. Now, the strategy that we're developing, the draft strategy done, addresses some of that, but we need a far more structured uh, approach to it. We cannot rely as heavily on, on, on one individual or a very small team like Dave's, as we have done in the past. We it just won't be sufficient to get us up and, and, and keep our heads above the water line. We got out quicker than most police agencies. Uh, when we went out in 2000-2001, in 2000, 2001, it was a very effective response. But uh, over that time, I think we had about 220 ELOs across the country. Dave. They're not as effective as, as they were. Some of them are not permanently employed on ELO duty. They've been taken over, over since 2009, obviously, like, you know, it's all shoulders to the wheel, you know. So the structure isn't as it should be now in the current context. So we have a bit of work to do. It is in the strategy as we've developed it at, at the moment. But look, we can't get away from the fact that, in fairness, Dave and his team did more than was expected of them. And if they didn't, we may not have kept our heads above the waterline as, as, as high as it is at the moment. And, and thank you, and in the answer to that, you've made a very significant point, and that is to say that with the passage of time, people who were new arrivals 20 years ago are the parents of um, adult children at this stage, and they are as part of the warp and weave of this community as anybody else uh, in the country. And if this sounds like a slightly grudging note, it isn't intended to be. But one of the one of the sadnesses, I suppose, is that there won't be the the kind of opportunity that's there at the moment in terms of the accelerated recruitment for quite some time again to reflect that thinking and that aspiration in ways to change uh, the composition of the organisation, which arguably is an essential part of, but not an, not an the one doesn't absolutely depend upon the other but an important part of changing the level of, uh, of uh, the service. There's I, a, yeah. I, I, I agree with you. I think the opportunity is still there. We <clears> haven't <throat> lost it in terms of our penetration with the, the diverse communities across Ireland. We've done quite a bit of work over the last number of years with quite a few people. You know, but I think the opportunity still exists for us now to put some real structure on it and really resource that, and we can capitalise on what we've done up to now. If we don't, I think we could find ourselves in, in a very different place you know, over the next five to ten years. Thank you. Move on, Thanks. if you don't mind, Bob. Yep. Just, just to underscore the point Bob made, I, and I hear you about the ELOs, I consider it's really important that you get out of silos, whether they're central silos like Dave or local silos, because <coughs> customers and victims don't engage with an ELO. No. Customers in, and victims encounter a guard. And so we're, we're encouraging you to think mainstream rather than silos about issues to do with outreach and issues to, make, to do with making sure that your engagement with diverse communities is, with all communities, is the same. Judith wants to come on, and that's a link, if you like, <coughs> into something Judith wants to talk about, which is hate crime. That's actually in the strategy, Chair, in terms of accessing at the front <coughs> end in uh, Templemore for all trainees coming in, that they'll get the required uh, training and that the um, diversity strategy will be integrated with the community policing strategy. You're not talking about a single ELO, you're talking about all those uh, um, uh, employed on the front line actually coming into the mix in delivering a, a service in a diverse community. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Commissioner, I'd be the first to acknowledge that um, police, when dealing with hate crime, are dealing with the symptoms of a much deeper-seated societal problem, which the police alone will never solve uh, without partnership and legislation and support across many agencies. So let me just put that, uh, my, my questions, in context uh, with regard to that. But uh, obviously, the first step in developing strategies to deal with hate crime is understanding the scope and the nature of the problem. So with that in mind, does the Garda Síochána have a settled definition of hate crime? Ask maybe um, Gorshin or Paddy to deal. I, it, <coughs> we, we are having this discussion. Uh, I, I can deal with that, Chair. In terms of the actual definition that we use is the definition that came out of the Macpherson Report in 1999, coming out of the Stephen Lawrence uh, inquiry. So that's the definition that we use. And what that basically says is the uh, definition is centred and is defined as follows. Any incident which is perceived to be racist by the victim or by any other person. Now, I know that is specifically def uh, defining uh, racism. But we go on into our system, uh, the PULSE system, and we uh, disaggregate 
racism into 11 separate categories. So when you go in, you can actually determine what aspect you know, of uh, hate crime is, 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 is part and parcel of the event that you've witnessed or that you're investigating. Now, that uh, list, that disaggregated uh, definition is uh, almost entirely reflective of what the OSCE use in terms of their definition, but they actually define hate crime. We don't have hate crime defined in legislation here in Ireland, so we use the Macpherson uh, report definition, but on the Pulse system, there, is, there are 11 categories that you can choose from uh, in order to determine that okay. it represents a hate crime. And, and do those categories include homophobic crime, yes, crimes against people with disabilities, uh, uh, gender-based violence? That, okay, thank yes. you. So, if that definition then has been adopted within the organisation for some years, I'm at a loss to understand then why in this year's policing plan a commitment was set to develop uh, a hate crime definition. Um, so can you just explain that to me because it, it indicates to me that perhaps there, there isn't a shared understanding across the organisation of that definition. Well, I think while we do have a... <laughs> Perhaps a definition, the kind of question would be to how widely is it um, taken on and how widely is it known or absorbed. Uh, as you know, we had a target in last year's policing plan to increase hate crimes, um, increase the, the re recording of hate crimes. So yeah, the reporting, yes, and yes. recording. Yeah. Yes. We don't want to increase recording. No, indeed. Mm. So we wanted to improve the recording of hate crimes. But as we began to see an increase in recorded hate crime, that's when we began to have a look at the, the detail of the, the incidents. And it was at that stage that questions rose in our own minds in terms of the analysis service about, the, the, for a better word, we all would use the term, the integrity of the record. Is that a freestanding record that makes sense? So the question was, when we looked at certain incidents, was there a motivating factor here? Or did somebody actually tick a box just because it seemed to describe an element of the incident? A, a classic example would be ageism. So we would be seeing incidents where the motivating factor, ageism, is being ticked, but as far as we can see, there was no motivating factor within the incident. It was only that the injured party was older than uh, uh, the suspect offender. So that began to lead to kind of, uh, questions around, well, what's the depth of understanding in terms of what do we mean by hate crime uh, in the processes of, of recording it? And while, you know, Paddy has talked about the, the person uh, definition is the one that we have, I think it's, it's, it's interesting because <coughs> even thinking about the person definition and, and knowing our crime counting rules as well, there's, there's elements of fuzziness there, I think, that we probably still need to um, clarify. So one of the things I do think we need to do is to actually look at that definition. We have the definition there, but probably we need to go above and beyond what we have done so far in terms of um, making people aware of that. I know that Dave does talk to the specialists, the, the LOs and, and, and the others, but kind of the question is, you know, I know that yeah. Dave doesn't get into college. But no. so, so uh, am I understanding you correctly then, when you have a settled definition, the issue is, is it well understood right at every level across the organisation and is hate crime properly recognised? Is that, are those the questions you're addressing rather than the definition? So there's a settled, there's a settled definition, but I think, um, there's a conversation starting there. I have, a, I, I have, and some others have a query about our settled definition and how it fits in with the crime counting rules. So McPherson says, it doesn't matter, you know, if the victim says that it was a racist crime, homophobic, and we expand it out. Or incident, crime, for, or for that incident, matter. Yeah. It's recorded as such. Yeah. yeah. Uh, our crime counting rules actually kind of slightly flip it around. Our crime counting rules say that the guard has to satisfy themselves that the incident took place. So, how does that kind of square with McPherson? And it's, it's a question that we're just kind of having a, it's a question that we've just kind of raised and I think we just need to kind of think about clarifying that so we're, we're all clear about exactly the processes of, 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 of when somebody reports an incident to us, how best to kind of record it. And it is also about improving the awareness and that means getting people through the college. It's not at variance with the OSCE. I mean, first and foremost, the crime or the incident must have taken place. That must be determined. Now, it's up then to the, uh, up to the victim or any other person to determine that it was motivated by hate or bias. And that reflects the OSCE definition uh, yeah. as well. But Gertrude is right. It's in terms of this, this uh, definition was accepted in 2007. 
but there is an awareness aspect of it that we need to get into. And Dave, in, in fairness, has been uh, trying to get in. But the key issue in all of you, what you've said is that the definition, of the McPherson definition, relies on the victim or any other person's perception, not the police officer or the call handler. But the police person is any other person. Can uh, be, indeed, yes, of course, uh, they so may the well. So the police person can determine that it, it yes. was a, a, a racist incident yeah. or you know, a hate crime. But from my experience, the challenge often is that the police officer may not necessarily think that the incident is a hate crime or a hate incident. And, so and, 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 I, I, and I mean, it's not that I'm, I'm disagreeing with you, but you're, and that's why McPherson was so broad. If the Correct. victim okay. perceives so, it to be hate crime, the guard or the, the police officer can't determine it wasn't. Exactly. All. So all of that being the case then, how confident are you in your current hate crime figures? I wouldn't be hugely confident I mean, at the moment. No. I think there's a piece of work to be done about it because I th I, even at the, GISC, at the gatekeeper, I think there's a series of questions that need to be asked, and whether it be a cheat sheet or whatever, that when you uh, bring forward an incident, you know, there are a series of questions that need to be asked in order to categorise whether it was or whether it wasn't. So that's a piece of work that will be part and parcel of the uh, strategy. Uh, Dave has been looking to get in the front door in uh, Templemore for year, years in terms of dealing with this, or his office, his staff, in order to deliver training in relation to this. So there's quite a significant awareness piece that needs to be done around this, Judith, that's for sure. But there's a couple of choke points or gatekeepers that can actually really affect the figures around this. I think it's important to say, uh, Judith, as well, in the context of the gatekeepers, that we, we have a data quality team now. Who, and that, that aspect has been rolled right across, and it, as we can, in the next few months, it's going to go to another two regions. Yeah. Once we, like, we have a smaller group of people, then they can have to make the call, and a smaller group who we have to uh, ensure are, uh, are up to a level of understanding of exactly what this means. So we can have that assurance that as things come in, that they can make that call or they can ask those questions in the context of uh, what is or isn't a hate crime. There's another aspect to it, sorry, Gershon, for cutting across you, that people probably aren't uh, aware of, is that every incident that's actually registered on Pulse underneath those headings, every morning it's taken off the system and it's addressed by somebody in, in Dave's office, you know, who will determine whether or not contact is required with the guard or with the victim. And that's every single incident that finds itself on the system, mm. you know, under any of those headings. Well, j just listening to you, I am concerned with the capacity of uh, Sergeant McInerney's office, uh, and that's no reflection of you, David, at all. <laughs> uh, but given that within uh, PSNI, for example, there are, I believe, eight hate incidents reported every day and six hate crimes reported every day. So, uh, you know, extrapolating that out to the bigger uh, geographical area that, that you police, it's quite likely, and that again is, is, is significant under-reporting, uh, even within PSNI with those figures. So I would expect there will come a time when you will be snowed under. Um, ideally, we want to get the people to come forward and report hate crime. So is there thought being given to the capacity to respond, to support, to investigate, to recognise hate crime? Business case is in for quite a while now in terms of that. You're absolutely right. In their current capacity, if we were to get a real increase, yeah, we'd be, we'd be stretched for sure. Okay, well, well, let's move on then from the definition. And obviously the, the committee will want to discuss this in, in greater depth, I would say, over the months ahead. Um, but if we move on to the, um, the first responders, if I can call them that, because there's plenty of research and commentary that says that the knowledge, understanding and attitude of the first police responders or call handlers is absolutely critical in building victim confidence and in getting victims of hate crime to stay with the, the criminal justice process. <clears throat> so what um, training is given to your call handlers and to your first police responders to recognise hate crime when it may not be immediately obvious? Sorry. Yeah, basically, uh, just, Judith, thanks uh, very much. Um, in relation to the first line responder, just to tell you exactly what, first line responder goes to a call. It's a broken window. There's a black lady living in the house. She states that she believes this is basically a motivated, it's, it's, it, the, the crime has been motivated by hate because of her colour. The first responder will, you know, he or she will be more interested in, in the, I suppose, the substantive offence the criminal damage to the window. But the motive probably wouldn't be 
the main reason, you know, they're not really going to be engaged really with the motive because they're moving on to another call. They say, look, ma'am, no problem. We'll take the details here. We'll try and arrest somebody for the broken window, whatever. I'm just simplifying this. That's okay. For the lady, what is the issue here? It's not the broken window. It's the fact that the crime was motivated by hate. She perceives that the crime was motiva motivated by hate. And it's critically important that the first line responder has knowledge of this. However, the next phase is this. If an ethnic liaison officer has to respond to that call, he or she will engage with the motive because they will understand that this victim is basically upset over the motive, more so than the broken window. You asked the question, what is the training for frontline officers? And Assistant Commissioner Leahy said that, I suppose our unit would need to get access to the Garda College to make sure that those younger Gardaí who are first line respondents, that they understand the complexity of hate crime and the fact that it's not a black and white issue. You're dealing with a substantive offence, but you're dealing with the motive, the motive which is the most important for the victim. So training for the frontline officers those who, younger officers going to stations okay. is imperative. And, and, and thank you, David. That's really helpful and it's really important. But obviously, it's not just the officers in Templemore. It's those who are already out uh, on patrol mm. in stations. And it's also the call handlers who may be receiving the emergency call. Um, and it may not be as obvious mm. as, as the scenario you have depicted. So it may be, uh, for example, a crime against someone with a disability or a homophobic um, incident, which on the face of it uh, isn't immediately obvious. Uh, so what training do patrol officers receive and those receiving the calls who may actually be civilian staff? Perhaps I could address that, Judith, just to, uh, we got a full inventory of the materials that are pulled together, formal training for existing staff through CPD and those going through the college and diversity has no less than uh, nine modules on various different programs from promotional training programs to the foundation program for taking people in and or a range of programs specifically designed to deal with diversity. So there's a set of learning outcomes and I'd be pleased to share this with you because it's a, it's a very comprehensive response to the question that you've, you've asked and answered. Well, maybe but, that's the best thing. If, yeah. if you could share that with us, John, that, that, would be, that would be very helpful. Um, it's interesting that the public attitude survey uh, published for last year um, shows that in many cases uh, there's very uh, good confidence and trust in uh, the organisation, but when people are victims of crime, their confidence in respectful treatment by the organisation goes down. That would concern me, uh, given the conversation we've just had. Have you any comment that you'd like to make on that? Sorry, I didn't pick up so the last, last part of your question. It, with regard to, uh, you know, the, the trust and confidence yes. is very high in your organisation, and mm -hmm. rightly so. But when people are victims of crime, their, um, their confidence in respectful treatment by the organisation tends to be lower. So something's happening when people are victims of crime in terms of how they're treated by the first line responders. Do, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, well, obviously, we have done a lot of work on the whole area of, of our victims' offices, uh, and I think uh, that there has, it's only in, in the last survey, if I'm right, Gretchen might correct me, is that that showed a slight decline in the context of, of, the, of the confidence of, of, of victims in our, in our service, but that it was on an upward trajectory after the introduction of our regional and divisional uh, offices in the context of victims' offices. Uh, look, I think it's it, we we saw this as a as a, um, it, a few years ago when it was introduced uh, as essential to getting that um, I suppose local input right around the country, uh, and there was a very good response to it in the early days. I, I have asked that question: Why why has this started to come down in the context of having that? very local uh, um, presence. So what we need to look into that and see and understand why. But I, I think it may be just, I hope that it's just a, a small uh, blip in, in, in an otherwise improving mm -hmm. picture in the context of the services we have made, made available to, well, to victims. It's something we're very alive to in the yes, committee yeah, and, yeah. and I'm sure we'll want to discuss further. And just one further question from me, sure. Chair, finally. If, 
uh, if I may. Um, I talked about detections earlier. Do you have the capacity to compare detection levels for crimes motivated by hate against those crimes that are not <laughs> motivated by hate? So, for example, um, assaults. Can you pull out of the system those assaults which are racist, homophobic, etc., and compare detection levels against those assaults which are not, um, don't have those characteristics? And is there a pattern emerging with regard to better performance in one area than the other? So, um, simple answer is yes, um, can, but of course that is dependent on the accurate recording of those original hate crime incidents. Yes. Um, I would say what we, we probably would actually have slightly better detections, I would say, just intuitively than other jurisdictions because of the absence of hate crime legislation. Because we don't here probably need to prove any ad additional elements to mm. um, uh, any motivating factors. So, for example, the, the law in the UK on racist offences requires an additional element of proof, uh, uh, which makes which is difficult at times. Mm. So, Intuitively, I, you know, it's always compare, hard to compare detections, but we can do it. But I have to say, Jude, it would be something I'd be reluctant to do because I think we need to get the data yes. into shape before we can actually make some conclusive... But the important point is you have the capacity yeah. to do it, and so you could see if there were any issues with regard to hate crime investigation that detection levels were significantly lower than those crimes without a hate crime motivation. Can I, I would say that the way to do it is if you probably did it on a case study basis yes. rather than actually kind of look at it and the figures in the totality. Again, because we're not capturing, I don't think we're capturing the full yeah. uh, extent of the crime. A absolute final question. Um, I, I know you mentioned there isn't specific legislation in this jurisdiction, but the, the uh, motivation can be mentioned in court. Um, so do you know how many cases have been mentioned in court with a hate crime motivation where it's been a, taken into account in the sentence and, and is there any learning from that? Would the DPP have those figures? Um, we can check with the DPP but I'm not too sh sure if the DPP would record that but we can certainly kind of, um, ask our colleagues there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Judith. Um, Dave, before we go off the subject of diversity, yes, and Valerie has one final question, and I'd like to give you an opportunity. If there's any specific piece you'd like to say to us on diversity, because I'm conscious of the point that Pat made about <coughs> your specialism in that area. So I'd like Valerie asked for a question, this just to give you time to think. Is Thanks, there anything sure. in particular you'd like to say to us? Thanks, sure. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a short, very quick question. What's your policy on, on uh, providing cover for family leave? Say I'm a sergeant and I have a unit of what? Would it be? Cards, and one of them goes on family leave, statutory or non-statutory. What's your policy on giving me cover as a sergeant for a full unit? Yeah, we, we're, we've been stretched historically to provide that on a, on a it, it's unit dependent and district and division dependent. So the policy really has been to optimise as best we can. Sorry, is, there a, is there a policy to, to, to always provide cover when somebody's going on, we say, maternity leave? We haven't been able to do it numerically, is the reality. So you don't have a policy to provide we, we, cover we on don't, maternity We don't have a policy other than, effectively, local deployment. So if I'm a sergeant and I have a team of 12, and one of them is a woman of childbearing age, she could go for a year, she's quite entitled to, and, and everything else, but she won't be replaced on my unit. And so, you know, the, the likelihood is it may happen in, in the context of the resource availability. Okay, is, that some, is that something in your workforce pl it is, plan it, that you not have addressed? That. Not alone that, Valerie, but I think one of the things that we began to look at, we, we began to model, and you'll see this in, in some of the, the papers that we've put together, as we increase the gender balance to you know, a, a greater number of females working in uh, frontline policing, there is a, an increasing exposure, and paternity leave as well, so it, 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 it's not unisex in any, in any respect. But we are looking with deeper right now to consider an hours model as to how it is we deploy resources, and not to just think of it in terms of heads. So you're, look, you're, look, you're looking at, is this not something that in the context of the surprising statistics you saw last year that would become a priority? It is a priority. In, in terms priority of demonstrating the organisation's support for people with family commitments. Absolutely. We, 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 Sorry, Chief. We, we don't have a panel, Valerie, in place that we can draw on. To, uh, I, well, I suppose that's my question in your workforce <coughs> plan. Do you have a plan to have a panel to draw on? Given, given 800 a year, people under 32, 
26% growing female, exactly. plus the men who will be increasingly um, availing of paternity leave. You also have maybe an ageing population at the other end who may have parental care responsibilities. My question is coming from the perspective of if I'm a sergeant or an inspector and resources are scarce, you can see where I'm going. Absolutely, and you are you're, you're, you're available you're very perceptive it's in available that. It's available talent that It's available want. talent, and yeah. we have a real issue there and in terms of the agility with which we can respond, and we're seeking to <coughs> model this out with a greater okay. level of recognition. Okay, what I'm asking is, I'm looking at the team who determined the policy on this, so I'd like to see progress sure. in the policy. Thank you. Dave, is there anything you'd like to say from your experience about the Im impactful way the Garda Síochána engages with diverse communities? Thanks very much, Chair. Um, what I would say is the most important aspect here is that every police officer must understand why they join the police. They have to realise the communities they are policing. And if they base their opinions on the class of a person or their, <coughs> excuse me, or their ethnic status, if there's any negativity towards minorities, they cannot function as a police officer. Anti-profiling policing techniques is the secret to this. Because when a police officer leaves the training college, the first person they're going to meet on the street is either a member of the Roma community, a traveller, or some black person, possibly involved in petty crime or whatever. If they base their opinion on people from making arrests or from summoning people, they can't function as a police officer. They cannot police in a non-discriminatory manner. And this is the problem throughout Europe and the world, I would say, where police officers do not understand the community they're policing, that most of the people we meet with are marginalised. And if we have a problem with that, you shouldn't be in the police. And this is what I try and tell <coughs> the liaison officers and specialist interviewers, that they've got to understand that if I arrest somebody and if I bring them to an interview room, if I'm a specialist interviewer, if I'm a level three interviewer or whatever, I need to know their background. If it's a Muslim, is he or she a Sunni Muslim, a Shia Muslim, an Ahmadiyya Muslim? I've got to know these things. If we want to have a pleasant interview, if we want to get the best results, you have to understand the person you're dealing with. So the police officer on patrol, and it's the most important part of policing, on foot, meeting people, talking to them. It's the only way that you can actually challenge prejudice and challenge racism. Because as I say, the reality is that for police officers, it's there. The people we arrest, unfortunately, are from, as Bob says, the lower classes who are marginalised, their colour, which they can't change. We have many black Irish here now, I think the Assistant Commissioner pointed this out, which is very important. And this is the reality. So again, I will go back to training and say, number one, to a police officer, why have you joined the job? Do you know the people that you're going to be policing? They have this impression that of a different community. They don't understand that they will be dealing with people with mental health issues. People are very vulnerable. LGBT people are not out. Who are actually afraid to go to the police because if they've been attacked or whatever, they can't because they're afraid that their identity will be revealed. They may be married and that their whole life would be ruined. So it's very important to understand the vulnerable nature of the communities that we're policing. So in all training, <clears throat> I think the first thing is that it's a challenge prejudice. If the attitude is any way negative, you cannot function as a police officer because your behavior would be completely wrong and it destroys the culture of the police. Next thing I would say is extremism and radicalization. It's something we hear about now through Europe. Armed people need to understand that if their attitude is any way negative towards minorities, they will actually cause people to become extreme. They will actually radicalise people that were never radical before. So if I'm a Muslim person, and if, take for example, there's a terrorist attack in the UK or France or whatever, straight away there'll be focus on me. If a police officer stops and searches me or treats me in a way badly, I will feel vindicated and say, well, maybe these radicals have a point after all, how I'm treated, I'm treated with disrespect. So these things, you don't really see this, but for a community police officer to engage positively with minorities, it's very important and it ensures that extremism doesn't become something very radical because there are people out there who are suffering in silence, who have come from countries here, is essentially from, what you're saying. from Syria and Iraq, who have come here and you, you need to know what's happening in their world 
and transfer it over here and treat people with general respect. Thank you, and thank you. For Thanks very much, Chair. And um, clearly, the diverse Ireland that we're in, and we're going to increasingly be in, that message is going to be more important. Hence, the policy and the strategy um, are very timely. Um, I'm now going to move on, uh, if you don't mind, to um, the next agenda item, which has to do with your interim report to us on what our agenda calls the examination of issues associated with Garda Youth electronic referrals. And this is um, a much more significant and serious issue than the title might suggest, um, uh, as, as, as we both know. And our discussion on this is going to be led initially by uh, Moling Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for, uh, for the report which you received in the, in the last couple of weeks. Time is obviously constrained, so forgive me if I cut across responses to ensure that we have the opportunity both to question and receive answers within the time, within the time available. Just to set a context for, for people listening or watching, uh, in, this, in, this particular, in this particular topic, um, the issue relates um, to um, Garda Youth Diversion and the, and the programme. And, and it's been in place since 1963, and I think we gener there's generally uh, an, an acknowledgement that it's been extremely successful in terms of diverting young people um, uh, under 18 away from the criminal justice system. And, you know, all the stakeholders involved in the, who've been involved in the criminal justice system um, and beyond uh, would, would speak highly of it. There are obviously significant concerns in relation to, in relation to this particular programme as it has been operating over the last number of years, and that's what you've been, uh, that's what you've been um, addressing. And if I might at the outset uh, commend Assistant Commissioner Leahy and his team and um, my association of Commissioner in relation to the resources that you're attaching to uh, your uh, addressing an investigation and interrogation of what's, what's been happening. The authority is really concerned, significantly concerned in relation to the issues that are arising. Just by, again, by way of context, this has arisen uh, from the work that was uh, undertaken by the Guard of Professional Standards Unit between 2015 and 2017. And in, in short, they identified three, three areas, this is for the benefit of listeners, three areas of concern. Uh, Pulse and youth referrals remaining as, as dra in draft status and preventing the, the our youth diverse, uh, diversion office from uh, processing the youth referral in a timely manner. Then youth refers not assigned to um, juvenile liaison officer guard in accordance with policy. And thirdly, a significant lack of follow through to prosecution in case where the director has deemed the youth unsuitable for inclusion in the programme. Now, because I don't have a great amount of time, I want to focus on one particular area, but maybe I'll make, make, make an observation in relation to, in, in relation to uh, one of the other areas. First, firstly, and uh, that's in relation to um, the youth referrals not being assigned to a juvenile liaison officer. What, what had been established by the, by the initial study was that in the um, seven-year period, seven-and-a-half-year period, um, you indicated or at, the, at the, yeah, the end of in April 2018, the number of youth referrals that hadn't, had no juvenile liaison officer assigned within the particular time, time frame uh, it, it had been at, at a, a significant level. It, it, had, it had been, uh, Pat, if I remember, something around the 320 mark or thereabouts, and it reduced significantly in the latter part of 2017 and would appear to me as if it reduced as a consequence of its identification as being an issue by the professional, um, by the, by the um, professional uh, standards, um, the professional standards unit. And my concern about that is, is that it, it required something like that to lead to its reduction, and it would suggest that the appropriate supervision and governance of the process was deficient in the period before then. Do you have an observation on that? Uh, what I can say, Mullum, is that is part and parcel of the investigation at the moment, or the inquiry mm. at the moment, and that will be reported uh, upon, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure there will be some mm. of that that will be uh, yeah. uh, revealed in the report. Um, you, you've seen what's in the interim yeah. uh, report. Um, I have an update uh, for you today. Um, I'm, I'm not going to get into the, the detail of it because what I am also doing is I'm inviting the uh, authority back in to yes. meet with the team. I think it's a far mm. better exercise where you can sit and you can ask the questions and you can get into the yeah. detail and data uh, associated uh, with this. 
but uh, you're right, I'm sure there's going to be issues around that in the final report. And I, I, fully, I fully appreciate, Assistant Commissioner, that, that this is an interim report and that you're working pretty assiduously on, on the detail. Uh, just, just, just quickly, when would you anticipate the final report being ready? What I, what I can tell you is they're validating uh, about 1,000 uh, incidents a week at the moment. It, it's a mm. huge amount of work that they're involved in, and you know that it was in the excess of 22,000 mm. that they've, they've started uh, with. Uh, we now know that validation, uh, there's a, a bit of work to be done in the validation to make sure that what we have is what we have and that we're absolutely solid in, in the information that, that we have around it. So we're probably looking at November for a final report at this stage. But again, what I'm okay. sa saying is we would invite the policing authority mm -hmm. back in, the team to come back in and engage with the team and get access to the information and the data as a so that you're fully aware of everything that's been mm -hmm. done and include mm -hmm. that includes the methodology that's been used and you get some flavour yeah. of what direction uh, the uh, investigation is going in at the moment and what it's uncovering. Um, that, having, that having been said, I think it's absolutely appropriate that we communicate to you the concerns that we have as a consequence of the initial um, divulging of the figures and, and the, particular, the particular one I think that demands, demands attention and I know that you'd be giving it significant attention is in relation to um, the, the number of referrals, that's 22,174 youth referrals that had no charge or summons directly associated, associated to, the, to the referral. And this, this, this again, by, 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 way of, um, by way of context, um, uh, was, was that, um, in that in that period, in, in, the, in the period under, um, under consideration, um, you had over 53,000 unique referrals where the director deemed the youth unsuitable for inclusion in the, in the, in the programme and you identified that of this there were over 21,000 unique referrals had no associated charge sheet summons attached and you, you did further work <coughs> establishing that nearly 13,000 cases it wasn't possible to identify a possible outcome, outcome resolution. Now, one can understand that I'd be certainly interested in you communicating, maybe maybe sharing with us what you identify as a significant risk associated associated with the fact that no charge or summons um, and may not have may not have followed a situation where the, where these youths were deemed unsuitable, recognizing that you've identified that there may be technology and various other issues associated with it. Well, I mean, the significant risk is that you have a victim and you have a child, and right. I've articulated this previously. That's the risk. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in terms of the why it happened, that will all be part and parcel of the investigation, but the human aspect of it is where the risk is for me and where we need to uh, focus. We've just over 7,500 of those uh, incidents validated at this uh, point in time, and we'll have that discussion uh, with you when, when the team come in to talk to us, to, to give us some flavour of where we're going and the human factor involved uh, in this. But I mean, as, as you know, nobody had to identify the challenge or the risks associated with this for me. I highlighted it myself and indeed and to yourselves. So look, uh, there is a huge human factor in this, very different to other issues we've uh, dealt with so far where you have absolute identifiable victims and you have children involved in this. So there's a, you, the, the, you, have, you, have, you, have you have identifiable victims and you have children and you also have the potential, if not the reality, that in the intervening period they may have been further victims and further significant crimes that might have been associated as a consequence. That's correct. As a consequence of this not have been and, addressed. And, and we've had that conversation with, with, mm. your, with your own team, you know, mm. in, in the office, that we are actually um, pursuing each one to see what has happened since. Where is the child? Where is the victim? What has happened as a consequence of inactivity? And also, all of that will absolutely be pursued. Yeah, well, I, I do also have a concern, Assistant Commissioner, that um, you've identified in the interim report that you've instigated disciplinary proceedings in relation to certain elements of issues coming out of coming out of the uh, of the work that was done by the Professional Standards Unit, and indeed, in turn, by your <coughs> probable initial initial reflection on that. I do have a concern, though, in all in all of this, um, that um, <coughs> that there is. A, a, a governance process or a lack of a governance process and a lack of supervision which reflects a pattern that we've identified and communicated to you in successive meetings between the authority and the guardie and that this is a further reflection of that concern which we've, which, which we've, which we've um, uh, communicated to you. So the, 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 my concern, if I might maybe I'd put it in the, form, in the form of a question, do you share the concern of the policing authority that there were significant gaps in governance in relation to this on your first assessment of it that have considerable implications 
for quite a large group of people, both those within the programme and indeed uh, the general population. Yes, and, and indeed, in terms of your reflection on the disciplinary responses, are you cognizant of the fact that it's not necessarily just the individuals who may be um, fingered in the first instance, but it may also be the supervisors to whom they were reporting, and that the reporting that you would have expected would have been in place certainly didn't reflect the reality over, over the number of years? Well, I don't want to go into uh, the disciplinary side of it. Yeah. What has happened in a report on the last uh, occasion is that chief superintendents who are responsible for the disciplinary uh, process mm. uh, on the front line, they've been told that uh, they are responsible for the disciplinary process and where it has been identified that a disciplinary issue may have arisen, they have to investigate it. And also yeah. now, what happens as a consequence of that, we'll see as the process goes through. But I mean, I can't direct somebody to... Uh, conduct uh, an investigation, but they have a responsibility. They own the process. They've been told they own the process. So in effect, as I said, Lassa, there's no free pass on this. And wherever it lies, it lies. The, the, issue, the issue as far as the authority is concerned is of such significance that we would have expected that the engagement right across the organization, and it's quite clear from the figures that you've shared with the authority, that this is an issue which covers the entire country, every single division, um, and every single district. Um, it, it's, it's evident that, that, that it's, been, it's been a problem. Because of the significance which, which you um, undoubtedly would have relayed and conveyed to the entire force, one would have expected that there would have been real engagement uh, right across the organisation. It would appear to us, and there was huge concern, and, and, and Noel would pick this point up in just, just a moment, a little bit further, that the fact that one third of the areas that you contacted looking for a response didn't give you the response within the time that you had that you had um, that you had set out. One, do you have a concern in relation to this? Number two, what has happened since since then? And number three, does it reflect a more deep malaise in the entire force which you've got to address? Well, I know that the first engagement, I don't think people realised. The, uh, the severity of the situation that uh, we were in. Uh, uh, on our final date, our closing date for uh, submissions in relation to this information return, uh, we received about 68%. They're still coming in beyond that date while we're working uh, on the report. Um, I don't think it's a malaise in total. There may be some of that found at the end of it, and we're open to finding that. But I do think there are some extenuating circumstances in terms of the movement of personnel and some of the issues that we're uh, dealing with. I do expect that we'll get a far, a far higher return before the end, but we may very well find some of that. There's Could there's I just, uh, Maureen, oh, sorry, just on this yeah, matter, uh, and the context of the awareness of all our divisional officers in particular of the gravity of this particular issue. I have visited, I've said on a few occasions, I've, I've, I've visited each and every one of our chief superintendents in their own uh, divisional headquarters. And this was one of the matters I had in my, in my agenda going into them, in the context of how they were dealing with this issue. And I, can, uh, I, I came away very confident that they were fully bought into the, con in, in the context of delivering whatever they needed. Uh, and I told them that they shouldn't spare whatever resource they need. Uh, what they did find, some of them, is that the problem was much bigger than they initially anticipated and it was taking them longer. But it's not for the want of giving it attention and, uh, and applying proper resources to ensure that all of the files that they were asked to look at were being looked at. Uh, so um, I, I uh, used um, that particular, uh, I suppose, problem that had emerged uh, as a, a now a very a uh, good way of showing and, to, and, and uh, um, demonstrating after the previous issues that we had been dealing with that this was something that they needed to do in a very urgent way in, and ensure that whatever information they had in the context of the files they were dealing with was given back to the central office in ensuring that the matter so I could understand as acting commissioner what the bottom line issues were across the board. Uh, and that I, that was what I, was I have no doubt, yeah. and, I'm, and I'm very conscious, Commissioner, that you've visited a great number of districts and stations, which is hugely commendable over the last period of time, and I have no doubt that you've placed a lot of emphasis on 
on, on, the, on the matters you raised, but there certainly appears to me um, to be almost a casual response taken by a great number of people within the organisation to requests that come from use commissioner or from assistant commissioners or various other people um, you know who have a, a coordinating or um, a coordinating or, or a, a, a lead role in relation to in relation to particular areas and that this is a further manifestation of what I would have seen as as um, a pretty a, a, a pretty regular feature of our engagement on significant issues within Garda Shikana. I have to say that I did not pick that up, that okay. there was anything of a casual nature. Okay. These people were coming forward with lots of evidence to me okay. of the amount of uh, effort that was going in, which I feel was absolutely uh, you know, uh, right. Uh, and, uh, but some of the deadlines that may have been set may have been unrealistic in the context of the size of the, 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 cha the, the demand that was being made. So uh, I, I wouldn't read that as being in any way uh, people having a, a, a cavalier or, or an attitude of the thing, uh, apart from it. Thanks, Morning. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner, moving on, from, moving on from, from that issue, one of the themes that's of concern to us is when you or a senior officer in Agatha Shikana issues an instruction and a request for information, is the tardiness that appears sometimes in replying. We saw this in the, uh, in the issues around breath testing, where some uh, division officers just didn't reply. We see it again in this one where the Assistant Commissioner gave an instruction and has a, a, appointed a, a, divisional, a divisional inspector in each division to get this information. The close-off date was the 30th of April. Only 68% of the replies came in. We have an update from the Deputy Commissioner in relation to the Jobstown incident. We see that the initial report came in on the 8th of January. A further report uh, with 44 recommendations was, was, was subsequently received on the 14th of March. Uh, as of the 20th of April, two very senior officers have still not replied and provided their views and observations and recommendations, and they were sought again on the 20th of April, and here we are at the end of June, and they are not forthcoming on such a serious issue as the Jobstown incident. So I guess as an authority, we're concerned at a perception that there is not always an acceptance and a realisation of the seriousness of these incidents, such as the three I've given you, and that when a commissioner a deputy commissioner or an assistant commissioner or indeed a chief superintendent or a superintendent request information that it's, that it's forthcoming by the timeline. Um, and there, it's that cultural piece. And I suppose the question is, what's your perception of that? And what's the sanction or what happens when someone doesn't meet the deadlines like the ones I've just given you? Say, for example, the Cusson one, 20, 20th of April, a deputy commissioner asking again for personal, personal obs views, observations, and recommendations on such a serious issue. So what's your perception um, of, of that, and what's the sanction for failure to reply? Well, first of all, the, the, the perception is uh, that I, and, and the, what I have picked up from my visits to each and every one of those divisional officers is that they're really uh, very uh, sincere and in, in their efforts to deliver within the timeframes that are being set. They will and have outlined some issues they may come across, and the best, with, with the best will in the world, there will, there will be impediments that, that come, come their way. Um, in, the, in the context where somebody is asked, and they have it in their gift to produce information in a timely manner, and they ignore it, of course there, sh there will be sanctions in, the, in those cases. And like, I, I believe that people should be asked, uh, and you know, that they should understand what they're being asked, in the first place, uh, given sufficient time to deliver the, the product that you're looking for, uh, and understanding some of the structures that they may be operating within in doing that. But once all of those things are understood, and that they're all things being equal, that the, the thing is still late, of course, I would insist that that, that action be taken in that context. Well, I might ask you, uh, Commissioner, to look at the report we got from the Deputy yes. Commissioner on the, on the Jobstown incident where you have a deputy commissioner writing to an oversight body saying the reason you didn't get our, your report, and we've been waiting for the report and it's a serious issue, is because two named senior individuals, two officers, haven't replied. Um, that's, that's a big concern and that, that type of thing is echoed in, in, in several other instances, like the, the uh, breath testing, uh, like the, the, the one that Maureen has just been dealing with you. So, so maybe take it offline and have a look yeah, at it and maybe course. revert and have a separate discussion. I'm really conscious, Chair, of four minutes being left, so I'll hand it back to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have one or two questions on this because 
The audience may not understand what we're talking about here when we're talking about the Utah electronic referrals. It seems to me that what we're talking about is that young people who were accepted into the program and who agree to go into the program and accept the strictures of the program received a particular kind of treatment. And the ones who didn't, because they weren't suitable in many cases, because perhaps they were more serious crimes, or perhaps because they were recidivist, got away with it. And I think it's important that the audience understand that's why we're spending a lot of time on this detail, and that's why you, Assistant Commissioner, are spending um, weeks, and now is going to be months of your time, and your team checking uh, thousands of, of referrals. And so against that background, and you feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, Two questions I have are this. Can you assure the authority that it's not still happening? Because legacy stuff, we fully understand, takes time to research and remedy. But we need an assurance that the bucket is not continuing to fill with referrals that are not being attended to. That's really an important question for us. And I didn't find that in the report, but I'm not saying it's not there. I had a lot to read last night. Yeah, uh, lots of changes have taken place. It's been evaluated as we go to see where we're at at any given time, to see if, if we're perpetuating the situation. I'd be confident by the time we get to the end of this that we will be in a position to say, no, it's not. Okay. But Thank anything you. that happens in the interim period, we will be able to pick up along the way. Okay. And the second one is there's a reference in your report to, towards the end of it, um, I'm not probably quoting it accurately, but you have a paragraph about victims and that at the end of the report you'll be able to say something to us about the impact on victims. Was that the actual victims, or will it also include new victims, if you understand me, that may have arisen in the, in in the intervening period as a result of repeat offences by some of the young offenders? Yeah, that's potentially where we will be going as a second step. New victims as well. Uh, absolutely. For somebody who wasn't dealt with appropriately, where there's a victim... Uh, uh, that you know, or someone who becomes a victim as a consequence of that, or maybe not as a consequence of it, but just happens. Absolutely, okay. there'll you. be an engagement there. And the final point I want to make relates to your remarks about discipline, and and I want to, I suppose, address these to the commissioner. Obviously, you can't direct people to take disciplinary action, but I have two concerns. One of them is that the disciplinary action shouldn't always fall at the bottom of the pile. And this relates to the question that Noel is asking. There's a big supervision dimension to this, any way you cut it. And secondly, I would like to think, given that this is a class, if you like, of cases, that there would be somebody keeping an eye on the consistency of disciplinary action. Uh, and that it wouldn't be the case that because of the delegation in place, and as you mentioned, <coughs> it's the responsibility of the chiefs, but that one chief would say, Asher, and another one would go to town on an officer, maybe appropriately. We need some sense that this will be dealt with as a class. And we also, I think, would encourage you, Commissioner, to think about that disciplinary piece in the round, if that's the best way I can put it, and not just to be focusing on the uh, bottom of the food chain. Uh, well, absolutely not, um, Chair. That's, that has been my message from the uh, get-go on this matter. Uh, the the standard, is, standard approach in the first instance, but the, in the context of any supervisory rank as well, that, were, that didn't do what they were supposed to do, that everyone <coughs> would all be addressed. Uh, and, uh, that has been the message. I take your point in relation to the, um, you know, the, the importance of ensuring that uh, it, uh, some central... Uh, some consistency uh, of consistency is important yeah. if we're to avoid um, a sense of deep unfairness or then other people feeling um, that somebody else wasn't appropriately attended to. If you're, I take it from you, the way you've presented your report, there's already some disciplinary activity underway, so it's really important that it gets underway in some sort of broad, consistent way. I'm not expecting micro-consistency, because interventions are different, and I get that, but at least that there would be a broad sense of consistency about it. So thank you for that. Um, we have one or two quick AOB items that I want to pick up, if you don't mind. And I know you've sat there very patiently, Chief Superintendent Sutton. Um, 
but we did indicate that it would only be two quick questions. You sent us a very um, thorough and useful interim report since we last met, and that report was fully considered by the Policing Performance Committee, and I know you attended that yourself. So there really are only two questions, uh, and there is much for the audience um, and for the public record as, as anything else. You've completed a number of cases now. I think it's eight? That's correct, yes. And, and so in relation to those eight, which have been the subject of the, a very rigorous process, and we've seen that, are you satisfied in relation to Article 2 investigations? Two bodies of work in relation to those eight cases. Were they fully investigated and are they compliant with Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights? And both myself and the full team are happy that they're in compliance with those two issues. Yes. Thank you. And the second question, which is related, and you put emphasis on the full team, and, and I think that's appreciated. One of the cases, there is a professional difference of opinion, which you have documented. And that's to be expected. There are always professional differences of opinion when professions... Uh, meet. Have you put in place a procedure in order to manage the professional um, difference of opinion and does the whole team agree with the procedure? I just may need a minute on this. At the end of an investigation file, the senior investigating officer would love to be in a position to make a recommendation to the law officers based on fact and evidence that's gained as part of the investigation. In the case we're talking about, I'm not going to go into specifics. No, I don't want you to. I won't. Mm -hmm. Consideration was given that four possible charges would be considered. Uh, very often what happened is the law officer, the directing officer, the senior counsel inside the DPP would bring the senior investigating officer in and ask them, What's your feeling? What's your good feeling about this? And they will not bring it or recommend a charge unless they feel it'll get over the line. So in relation to the difference, yes, there is. It's a very robust process that we're putting through, and there's differences of opinion, and there's heated discussions. And then if it means going back to the senior investigating officer to clarify issues, that's what we do. Yes, in relation to the difference of opinion in this case, there is an oversight body that we can refer it to and we'll get information back off them and everybody is in agreement with that process. Perfect, thank you very much. This is a topic that we've spent a lot of time on and Commissioner, you've had to listen to us a lot on. So I, I do want to acknowledge following our, the detailed examination that took place the other day with the committee in relation to your report, that in relation to the work that you have done to date, that we are satisfied. And I know that might sound like a very minor word to say, but it's, it's, you know, it's one we want to say, and we've wanted to say for a while. So I thought it was important that we should say it in public session and not just in private session, that uh, we were certainly fully satisfied uh, with the case, with the way, the detail, the manner in which you presented the cases, the way you presented to us the, the work that was done. And uh, we look forward to your next interim report when you have another six or eight done. That's correct. The process is... We have another eight that we're going to report on in similar fashion. Maybe the introduction and the conclusions might not necessarily be there, but the findings and the recommendations will be. And it'll be interesting to see, are they the same findings and recommendations from the second eight yes. as, as the first eight? Yes. And then we, we, we see where we're going. And the on. other thing that the committee asked me to note was that we, um, we were satisfied that you were picking up the strategic organisational learning yes. from your work, so it isn't just... Um, I, I, I was going to say it isn't just about cases. It's, it's a much more substantial piece of work and also the, um, that you weren't approaching it in a box-ticking, uh, automated sort of way. So, so thank you for that and I'm happy to be able to, um, to acknowledge that uh, today in public. Thank you, Chair. In private session, uh, Commissioner, we had a discussion with you about the, uh, the trial in Northern Ireland, so we're not going to revisit it, just to note that we had that discussion and we're coming back to it uh, when Commissioner, Assistant Commissioner Driscoll has, has completed his re report, because I had made myself a note for that under AOB. Um, there's an AOB item that's been bugging me, and it has to do with an issue I raised with you at the last meeting, to do with an allegation in the media that a van was parked on guarded property which purported to be um, attached to one side of the recent referendum. 
And we got an indication from you that there was an investigation underway. And I'd like to know, is that investigation complete? Or where it's at? Or how it's going? Because you know how, how that the authority would be concerned if any um, member or Garda resource became politicised in that fashion. Um, my most up-to-date information I looked for today, uh, Chair, is yeah, uh, that information will be available to me in the, in the coming days in the context of the investigation that, that, was, that happened. It has moved on to a certain extent away from the immediate thing you just spoke of. There was another element of that which has uh, actually been reported to GSOC. Okay. So um, I, can, I can... I can. Well, I'm not keen. I mean, we, we never want to get into individual cases and certainly not GSOC's business. I just wanted to register our concern and to be sure that it wasn't dropped now that the referendum is over, because that would certainly not be, um, not be a good outcome. Any of my colleagues have any final remarks or questions? No? Okay, just, just the last one, uh, Commissioner. If we could have an update on the uh, wrongful prosecutions and convictions for not having an NCT that took place. You had some work underway, and I'm conscious you may not have the, the member of staff here to answer that, but we'd like to know, is that now all concluded, and have all those uh, citizens been contacted and rectified? Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, finally, Commissioner, I am conscious following recent events, that you've made your own career intentions clear, and that this is most likely the last occasion on which we'll be meeting you in public. There'll be another day for long speeches and, and for, in, in private session, but I do want to acknowledge in public um, your service as a police officer, as a member in Garda Shikana, the manner in which you um, have engaged with the authority the manner in which you had to step into the breach at short notice and um, um, to thank you on behalf of the people at this side of the table. Gurmila Mahagat, Gohoraha, Asinkui in Er, Hanitu Igano, Leshan Tudras, Gagaramul, Gokurtesuk, Oskilche, Agus Erfal Dumsa, Agus Dan Tudras, Agus Gurmagat, Agus Ber Bua. Ramila Magat Kharli, Emma Fogel, Lakuna Jay, Uncle Me, Agus Camera Gra, and Hajerigumo, Mohils, Nagar de Shehan, Groshan Simur, Tagalor Ari Tarli, Agus Gulor Dulon, Agus Dulon Napog, Fos, Egnagrit, Ach Tamaglon Hinti, Gur Nadine, Sangar de Shehan, Agus Fin, Fi Hendricht. Commissioner no Game, Gulor, Ja, Obergenta, Agus Gudjakumich, Idir, and the Five Nishar Fad, Len Machdamsh. I really appreciate your kind remarks. Thank you very much. I look forward to uh, my next phase of my life, which is will be in retirement. Uh, I was honoured to lead the organisation for the past uh, nearly 10 months now, and um, in very difficult and trying times, but also in very interesting times. And uh, I think. Uh, as we look to the future and uh, look to the many changes that are going to happen in the context of uh, a new commissioner arriving and of the Commission of Poli Future Policing reporting that, uh, you know, I can see that in 12 months' time, based on some very good work that has happened over the past few years, um, <coughs> that we will and the organisation will be in a far better place. Uh, so, Thank you. So, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.